Jeremy? Yep. Hey, how's how's it going there? It's going well. Looking forward to figuring out what we're going to do today. <laughs> All right. Well, yesterday we actually did succeed in in the Arduino. Excellent stuff. I guess uh, a couple of pictures on a uh, few pictures on uh, internet on the OSC workshops. Um, we can actually post could put up some more pictures on that. But yeah, pretty much following the procedures on the DIY Arduino page plus. Heck, well, we changed we changed the design a little bit. We kind of just went through all the connections and said, okay, this is how we want to arrange it on our board. So after we got done studying where everything goes, we kind of wired things up in the most convenient places. So, but um, yeah, yeah, we actually did succeed at the end of the day. Like we actually had to do a little hack. Uh, I took a video of that, so I'm actually uploading that right now. Um, that actually just uploaded to OSC Workshop's Facebook page. So take a look at that, but yeah, you can follow this. So for today, um, yeah, we can get into what we're doing today, but Tom, Tom, so we're gonna do some power electronics Arduino based. Um, we can use either the Arduinos we made yesterday or try, uh, we also have some Arduinos in our kits, but we're gonna get into power electronics controlling power elements using the Arduino, using rapid on-off fluctuation called pulse width modulation to control power that goes to devices. So for example, we can control a light bulb using our Arduino. We can control a big motor or even a welder. With the welder, we're going to get into battery packs and welder, a sim very simple prototype. Uh, in the afternoon, uh, the main thing for today would be some, some of the, if we can get to reliable control of transistor elements which are power handling elements using the Arduino that we just made that will be a, a compelling experiment so I'd like to see if we can get all our Arduinos we, we kind of had to do some last minute hacks on the Arduino we figured it all out uh, but I think we should have all of them ready today so we can build build upon that for our controllers using the little Arduinos that we made so that's that's all <coughs> Yeah. Now, maybe Tom. Tom, tell us what we've got that we have prepared for today's program. Yeah. Well, today we so have. Speak up. Yeah. We have a uh, uh, Arduino-driven light dimmer application. That's going to be one of our first ones. We're going to we're going to cover first of all some basic theory about electronics and how the. Um, you know, you know the equations about how you calculate current and voltage and resistance and that kind of thing and then go directly into other applications we've got three different light dimmer applications one where we just drive an LED directly kind of like what we're doing right now uh, the the next one is going to be uh, using an external power supply and then I'm talking DC and then uh, we may just go over that in theory because uh, what we're going to do is jump from there and go directly to controlling the light bulb using AC directly out of the wall. And so it, uh, of European is going to use 220 volts AC and we'll, here in the U.S. we'll use 120. But so it, it'll work uh, regardless either way. <coughs> and uh, so we're going to use pulse width modulation. Uh, we're going to cover that also because uh, the basics of pulse width modulation, how that works. And, uh, did you want to talk about that? I mean, so maybe we can just, uh, since we're here, just dive right into what that all means. We can take some notes. Uh, yeah, uh, we need the instructional. So yeah, well, I mean, right now I think it's appropriate to say okay, <coughs> let's let's go over like the basics, the background of all of this. Um, I was hoping the other guys uh, would be on, like the Belgium guys, they seem to uh, have made, they responded and they seem to have gotten everything figured out or such. Did you guys look at the email? Mm -hmm. I saw yeah. some of it just now. Yeah, so I don't know where they are, but, but yeah, let's let's actually take some notes on, uh, on a pulse width modulation. So the, the relevant documents here would be, uh, so let's maybe link directly to that in... Um, 
So let's start Wednesday, January 29 on the J page. Twenty twenty, and the schedule. What we have there for the working doc that should be linked in the the day four program on the original program page. So let me cut and paste that link back into the schedule. Okay. Power control doc. So day four, yeah, let's maybe I can just copy this whole thing. Um, we can take notes in a Google Doc. That's uh, if we want to actually use this as an exercise. Uh, so Tom's going to drop a little bit of theory. He's got a. We've got a couple of working docs there already, but maybe we can um, do collaborative editing of the doc as we take some notes. Uh, that's an exercise. So I put the the document in Wednesday, January 29. There's a PWM power control document. There's an Arduino PWM power control tutorial. Those are two different documents. And Tom, any idea which one you're going to start with? So we have an Arduino power electronics tutorial. We also have an instruction on PWM power control. And I'll go into this main working doc and take notes there. I'll go into edit. So this one and this one. Oh wow. Okay. Which Mark one? There. Or is it a different doc? Scroll down a little bit more. This one right here. Yeah, this is this is my latest one right here. Yeah. Where did you find it? This is in a presentation right here on a day four curriculum okay. working doc. Yeah. And also, um, <laughs> there's some, you know, steam cam fun we can do here. When we talk about the light dimmer, uh, yeah, you can get a socket off the wall, but why don't we just print a 3D printed socket and put two screws on it for contacts using these 3D printed terminals that we have a design of, and you can pull down a a plug, a screw-in thing for a light bulb off the internet, 3D printed socket, and you can do that. So that's an interesting exercise if we want to do that. I'm not sure how much time we have. Uh, another interesting exercise is so when we do the welder, the simple application, I was going to propose we use this for a ground clamp. So we've got a welding electrode holder, which is a um, That's also in uh, in the January program. If you look at the main main program for day four, uh, there's a DIY electrode holder that we can also print. This is actually a good design from initial welder design doc. <clears throat> yeah, um, look at the ground clamp in that working dock. But there's a, also a, a very nice electrode holder that's a very simple design that lends itself to 3D printing. So it's a DIY welding electrode holder. So, of course, you got to have high temperature metal, but the remaining pieces which make it work like the tightening mechanism is 3d printed and we we can build that out of conduit half inch conduit electrical conduit so there's a cool thing there that we can we can do let me paste that into um, the main dock here so the uh, why Welding electrode holder. So there's a bunch of little treats in here that we can do. 
Um, in this do working document, actually, I, I did a bunch of like other, we have this design of this, what we call the power panel. And the concept is, um, if we're going to be mounting all these heavy, now we're getting into like larger components, like, like IGBTs, which are a certain type of a transistor. Uh, so here, like rather than all that being sprawled on our desk, um, we can print like a little 3D panel, 3D printed panel. Um, don't have pictures. I have pictures of that actually on uh, Facebook. So if we go to Facebook, uh, just to show you what that looks like. But I printed out this thing, basically like a pegboard, like an like a oversized prototyping board. Uh, which then you can insert snap-in elements. Uh, I want to show that. That's uh, that should be. I think I put it on my personal page here. Uh, so just scroll down a little bit, uh, but show you what it looks like um, in concept. Because if we're prototyping, we make it very modular, right? Uh, let me go to this is it here uh, this kind of deal so think of it as an oversized pegboard where you can insert elements and then these elements could be 3d printed with like a little clamp like a little uh, poke and barb that looks like like this uh, basically things like this like little pegs that you can insert into the into the holes um, so the concept is okay let's let's do like a little panel where we can put in a bunch of components including 3d printed terminals where because we're using all these m6 screws okay well we can use those m6 screws just like we're clamping down for example the pen or the or the height probe, uh, plastic lends itself to this because plastic is insulating so you actually make, can make terminals. Very cool. So we can have this 3D printed terminal thing, um, panel for prototyping. Now, I mean, that's going to take time and um, I don't know if we're going to have time, how much time we're going to have for any of that, but um, the concept is here so we can keep developing it. For example, for a uh, there's actually a page called Power Panel on the wiki, so let me um, let me link to this. So this is the link to all of this on a on a working doc day four curriculum. So there's the Facebook other page on the wiki. So there's there's actually uh, let's see we got the electro electrode holder. We've got another page called Power Panel. So we actually have the CAD for some of this electrical work and it's it's just initial cat it, it kind of works you got it we got to refine it but i'm basically putting in all these different elements so you can plug and play with electronics so for example do you have like a finished finished um, like what, is, what does this look like in the end game like this for example that's a that's a so you're plugging in this yeah don't don't have a finished thing so okay. for example you can mount this terminal this is gauge six wire you know, you can plug it into one of these holes, like right there. That's a terminal. That's a panel with a terminal on it. There's two panels snapped together with these uh, mm -hmm. snapped together joints, so you can make this any size. Um, and cool things would be to do things like, okay, so here, I'm going to go up here. So think of this, and I can't open up my CAD, but, but for example, for this, this would be one of the heat sinks like we have for the fans. Mm -hmm. You mount the fan on the other side using screws like we already know from the 3D printer extruder and put the power element on the other side because that thing dissipates a lot of heat. That melts stuff. You need cooling. To get like a welder, um, you're going to be dissipating with standard efficiency. Say like there's 90% efficiency. If you got a kilowatt, I mean, 90% you know, efficiency means that or like... 95 means you're, you're dissipating 50 watts that's like it's hot that's hotter than the soldering irons that we do so you got to get rid of that heat so a little fan and a heat sink does it and how does this work you we put one of those barbs on the bottom so the the gray the, the brown here 
is the 3D printed parts. We screw the, the metal to it. Uh, and then the, the brown part has a, a uh, barb that goes into the power panel. So it's a, it's a modular way to do it. You can put like a whole bunch of them. So in principle, you can have this uh, completely DIY prototyping design and you can make a welder of any size you like. You just put uh, one of them uh, for per, one of them per kilowatt, but it really depends on how much, uh, how big the, the power elements are. You can make them bigger, so like each one of these elements could, in principle, handle um, a couple of kilowatts. Um, probably that that would be practical, because I mean, because how much heat dissipation can you get from a fan in one of those heat sinks? I think it's probably gonna be at least 40 watts. We know because we cool our extruder. The extruder, for example, is 40 watts. Is it? Yes. And we know that when it's just at heat and you have the fan blowing, mm -hmm. the thing keeps very cool, yeah. like you can touch it and there's no problem. So we know that we have at least 40 watts before it starts getting any hot to the touch. I bet you could get probably get like 100 watts, possibly 150 watts, maybe 200, and then it, then it starts getting hot quite hot but these power elements are are designed to stand up to how much like ADC or <clears throat> it's like uh, 190 watts and I think they can go up to like 150 degrees C 150 C so in which case if we're mounting oh, that to plastic power throughput C. no yeah. just temperatures like the power throughput the ones we have are designed for up to how many how much what is was their rating 600 UGBT, watts. IGBT? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're um, I think, that, like, they said it could handle 180, around 180 watts. That's if it's pulsed. And of cooling, but power throughput. Well, well that, excuse me, uh, when I say 180, that's not watts, that's amps. 180 amps. Wow. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. and, and I find that. Amazing. Yeah, it can't, it can't. But so that, practically, the leads are. You'll see the in your kits. You'll see the IGBTs, the big power elements, that, the the transistors, the three-legged little critters. Um, you, the limit is really how much those leads are gonna yeah. transfer, and probably in practice, for the most, it'll be like thirty. Let's say thirty. But what's their maximum voltage? Just for the background on this. Well, the IGBTs we selected the ones that are six hundred volts. Yeah. So in principle, if you're running at 600 volts, 60 times 30, 600 times 30, what is that? That's 18 kilowatts. So within the specs, like if you can get 180 watts of heat out of this using our little cooling assembly, this little thing, our little panel, uh, is handling large amounts of power, tens of 10 kilowatts or so. That's a solid, that's a big welder. Yeah. So basically we're saying here, we're just kind of getting the background on yeah. this here. Uh, we can design these, uh, these power electronic systems that are driven by Arduinos because we give it little pulses of signal to this power element to turn it on and off rapidly to control voltage or turn it on and off mm -hmm. in a way such that you, you have something like a dimmer, for example. When you rapidly turn it on and off, depending on how the duty cycle, in other words, how far how long it's on versus how long it's off, that will determine the power throughputs. And we'll, we'll do that explicitly with a light bulb showing, okay, we're gonna turn our knob on our electronic circuit and we're gonna make this light bulb go fully bright or down to zero. You can, do the same principles apply to um, essentially a variable speed motor? Yeah, it depends what kind of motor it is. For a DC motor, yeah. yes, you yeah. can do that exactly because it's a DC load. You can go from zero speed to full speed. So you learn here. Or anywhere in the middle. Yeah, anywhere in the middle. So using what we learn here, you'll be able to mm -hmm. translate this to electric vehicle controls, for example. <clears throat> yeah, and like the uh, cordless drill, it, it would mm -hmm. be the, the same kind of DC motor. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to drive this using P PWM to you know, be able to adjust the speed and torque of the motor. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the cordless drill challenge, we can use a system like this to, to have full control over the speed of the motor, which is 
uh, more advanced than typical. The uh, typically it's just like on off Certainly. on multiple speeds here yeah, by mechanical, like, uh, mechanical uh, gears. Speed. Yeah, right. Yeah, here we can do otherwise, so we have extra capacity to do it. Um, we can still use DC motors, and DC motors are easy to control using this kind of thing. Now, if you have these uh, brushless motors, mm -hmm. they're a little more complex. You, you need a controller that's a little different. Um, but here you can do, like for DC, yeah, very easy mm -hmm. to control motors. Um, and there's a lot of DC motors out there that are for practical applications, mm -hmm. so uh -huh. brushed DC. But brushed DC is not as long life mm -hmm. as the brushless. So we like to transition to the brush brushless for lifetime design. Mm -hmm as opposed to uh, the brush. And so, yeah, we pay attention most to lifetime, so the electronics would help, and especially if we can truly understand the electronics, like we're, we did our Arduino, mm. and then moving on to pulse width modulated control. Yeah, we can do that. We can do very simple systems, and at that point, you, you want to use something that of a smaller form factor if you're going to fit that inside a, a cordless drill. I mean, we'd have to pretty much tighten that up, mm. um, use maybe some other maybe use like a mini Arduino, they also have these mini Arduinos too that, that are all on the, on the little board so uh, you can do that. So this is power elements. Um, so we should probably get into this, uh, the overview on the battery welder. So just to, just to give you an overview of why this is interesting, it's like you might have seen that people can weld off like a car battery or a couple of car batteries. Um, here you, we can do welding where you could, can control the voltage using more advanced electronics. Uh, we didn't get there. We actually, Tom tried a lot of that. We kept on burning out the power elements. Uh, but what we can do is an interesting thing still. So with the 18650 battery, batteries that we have in the kit, um, we believe that with about 10 of them, which add up to about 37 volts, you can do a welder using small electrodes. So basically a thing that weighs one pound, like around one pound. So each battery weighs like 50 grams. So you got 10 of them, you got 500 grams. So it's about a pound. Uh, so a device, like a little portable thing, like it could be on your cord, you know, like an attachment to the cordless drill construction set. <laughs> You've got this little power pack. Well, that's the, called the battery already. Um, and then using a, <laughs> a small electrode like 1 16th inch the very tiny electro the welding sticks welding rods they re only require like 20 amps and that's well within what the the little 18650 cells can do so we'll do this little one one pound portable welder and that can get you about five minutes of welding before you drain the the batteries but say for an emergency purpose of some sort you, you know you're stuck out there something broke I mean five minutes of welding that that can save you so it's it's a practical experiment and of course you can make these things larger because everything here is scalable now for the remote people if you have only X number of cells you can only get so much welding here we have like four of us here so we have four sets of cells so we can do like 20 minutes of that welding or like five minutes of more power using that welding uh, so maybe thicker electrodes or something. But it's an ex interesting experiment to actually do an applied uh, welding application using simple batteries, mm -hmm. like the batteries that will be used in, a, in the Raspberry Pi, in the cordless drills, and so forth. So when we design the cordless drill challenge, like we can uh, diversify into other applications like a cordless welder. Uh, they do have cordless welders out there. Um, and then from the ecology perspective, yeah, like the batteries are still not it. I mean, they're... Uh, right now, the battery technology is still kind of an environmentally damaging. You cannot have an entire global fleet of electric vehicles running on, on lithium-ion batteries um, because simply there's not enough lithium on this planet to do that. Right now, at current energy rates or current battery um, material lithium extraction rates, they say there's about 200 years left of lithium. Now that's at current rates, but I mean, if the if the car, the electric car industry just explodes, that's going to get sucked up in like a few decades. So uh, this is still not the answer. Just to kind of give you the perspective, like yes, these batteries are really nice, but we still have to look for 
for the next steps, maybe other advanced technologies. <coughs> for me personally, I, I believe that solar hydrogen, uh, I think uh, um, there's a case you can make that hydrogen energy is uh, the clean energy of the future. Not a lot of people are getting into it, and I think part of it is because it's a highly decentralizable technology, and therefore that means you're big company cannot put a monopoly on it because that technology you can split water anywhere uh, now of course there's high technology for how you store it uh, but you can still burn hydrogen in a regular com combustion engine so let me, let me add a modified something to engine. that is it one one thing about battery technologies is that it's evolved even just over the last couple of decades we've seen it go from like lead acid to nickel metal hydride to uh, uh, lithium the alkaline, ion. The, the lithium ion, and so there, there's going to be something else, some other formula they're yeah. going to come out with. It's a little better and all that. So, so we're not uh, not going to hang our hat on any one. We need to be able to be flexible and be able to adapt to whatever the the new technology is. And uh, going forward, the, the hydrogen that that just sounds like a really good way. If we can crack the water and get good hydrogen out of it, that's that's going to be a really good. Way it's to all proven technology. It's been around for a few decades. Uh, I believe that it's just industrial inertia and the fact that nobody's going to take a monopoly on it is why it's not going mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. That, from my assessment of the situation, that's, that's what it is. Um, if you look at the statistics for hydrogen cars, that's just, you know, and the very, you know, before the hockey stick takeoff, the, the numbers are growing. It's not like this is not, doesn't exist. The numbers are growing. There's, there's hydrogen stations popping up everywhere. Are, there, um, are those mostly in like fleet and utility vehicles? There's some in California. Really? Yeah. I just looked at the stats. Yeah, I think a lot of the initial ones will be like possibly fleets. There are some, there are hydrogen cars you can buy mm -hmm. right now. Or is they it like exist. In like the real world vehicles. implementation. Yeah. I know there are like commercial or con consumer cars like yeah. that, but I was curious what the actual adoption Sort of ratio yeah, has been I don't know, don't know the details on that, but it's one once again one of those things. It's like let's do that. It's it's good. This summer we're actually gonna do a oxy hydrogen generator for the fuel, the oxy fuel torch. So CNC mm -hmm. torch torch cutting. We're gonna do a an initial prototype of an oxy hydrogen generator for the CNC torch table. So we're gonna start getting involved in the in the hydrogen economy as we go forward. Um, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, like carbon, carbon nanotubes, there's a bunch of people talking about nanotubes mm -hmm. and other complex geometries with carbon that can store things, store mm -hmm. gas. So that's the future. Carbon, hydrogen, lithium, the other exotics, whatever, thorium, ain't gonna do it. <laughs> uh, Keep it simple. I mean, it's really like keep it simple, stupid. But to keep it simple, like Einstein said, it's like it takes extreme genius to get to the simplicity. Mm -hmm. uh, Einstein mentioned something like that. But elegant design is simple. And that's where we want to get to so we don't have the complexity. And that's kind of reflects what we do at OSC. We're trying to keep it to simple tools. Like what's the, what's the um, sufficiency, the idea of sufficiency. What is sufficient to accomplish a certain task? Something is sufficient, you know, s stop right there, move on to other things, <laughs> like solving all pressing world issues. <laughs> so that's a basic <coughs> intro to the power electronics here. So we're going to start with, uh, maybe we can go through the, well, let's see, now, now Chris joined us, so maybe let's check in with uh, your status, Chris, on where you're at. Uh, you can definitely follow us, so we succeeded on Arduino, we succeeded on... Um, on the plotter stuff, so you know you you guys can build upon that and make improvements. But where are you at, Chris, right now? Maybe you can fill us in. Um, I was, yeah, we're just checking up on uh, uh, your uh, well, I'll put on your um, progress too. Where um, can we mute that for a sec? Sorry, I, I have it on the, the screen so we can be watching you guys too. Um, but now I'm getting back. Yeah, I, uh, kind of cool. Just trying to TV actually. Is that any better? Okay, so um, yeah, so we are have made some good progress over here. We got um, uh, 
one do 3D working really well, and the other one we're still um, still doing a little bit more wiring on. Um, we uh, did some good free CAD yesterday, and we have uh, some uh, hand tool, a screwdriver to upload, and um, got our uh, setting up today to do uh, the pen plot and follow your pen plotting progress. We got a pen plotter built and uh, first version of the uh, 555 CNC uh, router head mount um, to nice. to test as well. Nice. Uh, so did you see that Don made this change that the pen plotter lives on the on the printer head? That's you have two choices for the pen plotter, the original file, and then look at a Don log, and he he created a new version which where the pen mounts right on the 3D printer head. It's actually pretty cool. So you can try oh. either. Oh yeah, I know. That's awesome. Yeah, we printed out the original one, um, and, and I, it, it looks like it's going to mount up uh, quite well. I have an extra um, uh, Z probe, so I'm just going to set it up as a separate tool head that we so we can swap it on. Okay. Yeah. It worked pretty conveniently for us to actually uh, rip out the the height sensor from the bundle, and then it just put it on a pen plotter attachment. So that that works reasonably well too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Awesome. So it looks like you guys are making progress. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the next thing we're going to run on, on this is uh, uh, we're going to upload. It might be a good um, uh, benchmark bit. Uh, is a uh, basically just a thirty centimeter calibration cube with some holes in it. I wanted to see. Uh, to calibrate some of uh, what the tolerances should be in, in uh, x, y uh, direction and what the tolerances should be with, with the 1.0 nozzle. Um, so we're, gonna, we're just going to basically do a test print and caliber it um, so that uh, so as we're, as we're working on more prints, we'll be able to get the, the tolerances um, in uh, right away. Cool. All right. Well, that sounds good. Uh, last, oh, yeah. Last, uh, uh, I'm, uh, we're going to work on is uh, I have a part supply here that I want to do some power uh, measurements, uh, metrics to see how much uh, power consumption is. Um, we were talking about that. Uh, Jeremy was asking about that some. Um, I have measured power usage before, but it would just be an interesting um, benchmark to get. Definitely. Okay. That's very useful data. We can put it in our specs. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. <laughs> So uh, hopefully we'll be able to replicate your, um, your uh, plotting stuff. Um, it's going to take us a little bit longer to get to uh, to to doing some Arduino. Okay. All right. Jeremy, do you have any questions at this time? Because we we're going to dive right into the the power electronics thing, the Arduino power control. No, I'm 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 good right now. I'm ready to. If you guys are going to stay online for some of that, or are you guys going out? Yeah, we are. Out? So let's let's just go through some basics here. So Tom, teach us everything about Arduino power control. <laughs> <Go>. All right. <coughs> yes, I am. Uh, do they, is this online sharing or what? I am currently recording this, but it's not online. So, so, need, uh, so if you want to go into the work document to follow Tom, go into the document that is instructional, a, PWM. Power control. I'll give you all a second to pull that one up. It's on the J page. So on the J page. Under your, your log. Oh, no, it's on the J page directly. Okay. So if you go to the J page, there's a link to the working document for day four. Not a link, an embedded Wednesday, January 29. And there you see a couple of links. So PWM power control doc, Arduino PWM power control tutorial. So go into the power control tutorial. Arduino power, it's called Arduino power electronics tutorial, right? Uh, yeah, PWM power control instructional. So it's not the one. I didn't have the... So in the one that says instructional, PWM power control. <coughs> you guys got it? Yep. Okay. I'm going to edit of that so you can go page by page. Okay.
Okay, so let's see. <coughs> so speak up. Yeah, this is the uh, version 1.0, and uh, let's go and look at the the table of contents. We're going to have a uh, basically, that's going to be the rundown, introduction. We're going to have go up, cover the goals and the circuit theory, and then uh, go into how do you calculate power. Uh, then we'll dig into pulse width modulation, then our, how we can control pulse width modulation from an Arduino. Um, then we go into applications. We've got three different ones the light dimmer, battery charger, and the cordless welder. Okay, and we're, gonna, we're, and we're gonna build the light dimmer and the other ones we're not? Uh, right, we'll build the, the, the light dimmer. Uh, we're, we're gonna kinda skip over the LED part of the light dimmer because we already have a blinking LED and that's that's uh, already done. Uh, we, we could use that as a reference but uh, at any rate then, then we'll uh, go and build a light dimmer that'll work directly off of wall current and this is e either the, our European guys over there you'll be using 220, 240 volts and then uh, we'll be using 110 over here in the States okay um, <coughs> let's see so let's skip on down to page uh, 4 of the instructional these are the course goals. <coughs> We're going to have an introduction of basics power electronics. We're going to talk about pulse width modulation. But before that, we're going to go look at basic circuit theory. You know, I, I, I know some of y'all may be comfortable with circuit theory about how to calculate, but we'll, we'll cover it anyway and just uh, give an overview. Uh, and then we'll dig into the applications. Okay, let's skip to the next page, and this is the basic circuit theory. Um, and I just saw a simple circuit there. All we have is a battery and a resistor. Now, um, when you have that, there's a very simple equation. Uh, the voltage equals amps times ohms. And uh, so you, in the example below, we're simulating a car radio. And then uh, we're running that with a 12-volt car battery, so we deliver 2 amps to the radio. So there's our formula. 12 volts equals 2 amps times the ohms. And now at this point, we don't know the ohms, but, but that's a variable. So we can divide out the voltage by the amps, and that gives us ohms. Now, it, now I know this looks really simple, but this is a very powerful formula that we can use all the time to, to figure out uh, the resistance and voltage and current you know, that you're going to use in a, in a circuit. Okay, skip on down to the next page, um, and this is uh, number three, calculating power. Now, the power formula is basically you get power by multiplying amps times your volts. And, and this, you can see in the example below, this is our car radio example. We take the 12-volt battery. We're using two amps, and so you calculate that. You multiply it, and you get 24 watts. And Tom, Tom, but what's an amp? Tell us some physical reality <laughs> behind it. Okay, an amp. Well, what an amp is, you have a wire, and it's, uh, let's just say it's a count of electrons running down that wire. And they quantify that by calling that amps. How many? Give me a number. <laughs> That's the, it's, it's a lot. It's a very large <laughs> number. Like, in an amp, it's like, I don't know. I have no idea. I, I don't have I, that I on forget. top of my head. But, but it's like, I think it's an order of like, billions or trillions or and I'm probably underestimating it, like it, one amp is a lot of electrons it's a very large number <laughs> and and it, at the end of the day I mean it's basically just a number that somebody picked and it's the metric that we use now you know I mean I'm, I'm sure somebody on another planet uses different formulas different measurement you know <laughs> and then but uh, fortunately when we switch to the metric system we didn't change that <laughs> go metric with our amps <clears throat> yeah, that's good. Okay, and uh, and all this, uh, the, I guess the same goes for uh, volts and watts as well. You know, this is what we use, but but watts, watt, watts is a very interesting kind of a formula because we use that in electronics and, and and also in hydraulics, and you know, it it relates to mechanical energy. It, it's just a measurement of power. 
And uh, the, the other thing that I found interesting is, is a lot of times people will confuse power with energy. And, and uh, energy is, is basically the summation of power over a period of time. And so that, that's when you get your bill at the end of the month and you're charged kilowatt hours. That's what they charge it. So we're ta taking watts and multiplying that times hours and that's what gives you power, the energy that you're using. Uh, and, and when we talk about power, well power is, is just an instantaneous measure of, of volts and amps. And, and so that doesn't really uh, convey how much energy that you're actually delivering. I mean, that, that's an instantaneous view of, of energy. Everybody got that? Power, yeah, just as if you want to think about it, power is a rate. Energy mm -hmm. is, a is a quantity. Mm -hmm. But there's some important, interesting points about power. You can have one battery and you can have it like theoretically give you like one 18650 battery uh, in theory it can produce like huge power but that means it will do it for a very very short time mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. that's the deal or you can have like a huge battery bank but give you a very small power out of it because you're just trickle and trickling energy out of there over time so, for example, a kilowatt out of one 18650 battery means that it's probably going to explode because it probably can't handle it. It would be like uh, 300 amps. No, you can't handle it, so it'll <coughs> explode. That would be an explosion condition. <laughs> but, yeah. But be clear about the distinction between the rate and just the quantity of it. Two different things. Energy, power equals energy over time. Okay. All right. And um, anybody have any questions on that so far? We're talking about basic circuit theory, how you calculate ohms and amps and volts, and then also power. Crystal clear. Okay. Cool. Hey, these guys are Crystal. smart. I, I think maybe I'm. Uh, maybe they're already ahead of me. We, the, the point where it'll be more clear when, it, like, in a case example, like why you might need to solve. With you know, for any okay. of those, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, uh, well, let's get to the circuit that we're building, yeah. like, we'll get to that. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, let's uh, let's next, next take a look at the next one. This is uh, number five in our course, uh, pulse width modulation. So, pulse width modulation, this is uh, it, it's a way we can control power delivery, mm -hmm. and we're switching the power on and off for regular intervals. So, we call those intervals periods and that's a, a period of time that the, the waveform occurs. So we have a, a pulse that goes positive for a while and then it goes to zero. And, and so that, that uh, period of time that it goes positive and zero, that, that's our period. And so every, every period we're going to pulse it on for a, a small period of time and then turn it off. And that, that's how we generate pulses. Now, we uh, go to the next step and we can uh, control the width of those pulses and and this is where we uh, this is where we talk about modulation so what we're going to do is modulate the width of our pulses and so in, in the example over there on page uh, six on the next one pulse width modulation uh, we've changed it to pulses on for a three-quarter of each period so this gives us a 75% duty cycle, and this this make means that the power is turned on for 75% of the time. And so what this does is it you can take a battery, say like a 18650 battery, 3.7 volts, and you can switch it on for 75% of the time, and then switch it off for 25, and then you'll you'll the average amount of of that you'll be delivering is 75% of its max potential. So, and then uh, conversely, you can see below there where we change our pulse to 25% duty cycle. And so this does the same thing, but it only delivers 25% of the time, 25% uh, of the power on average. And now um, we can also adjust the frequency of those periods that we're switching this on and off so that we, we get a, a, a much easier to smooth out those pulses using inductors and capacitors 
and so we can get uh, more of a DC output after a little filtering. And uh, when you when <clears throat> that's one thing about the frequency uh, these reactive components, capacitors and coils, is they are frequency sensitive, and if you use them correctly, then they will. Uh, you can use smaller, lighter components to get better filtering at, at higher frequencies. Okay. So you're switch practical thing is so you're switching when you have a, like a welder that's electronically controlled using this kind of method. You can have smaller components when you raise the frequency. So they raise the frequencies to like what, like a hundred kilohertz or so, hundred thousand times per second mm -hmm. that you're switching it on and off to use small components. Yeah, the, the one thing that you run into, it's kind of a limit, um, because what I'm showing here on the screen, we're showing pulses that are, that are perfect. And mm -hmm. you see it's a perfectly square, but in reality, when you go to, to turn on and off those pulses, you have some delays. And, and you'll, you'll see the, the vertical lines of the pulses, they're not totally vertical. There's a little bit of time it takes to switch it on, a little bit of time it takes to switch off. And so that, that, that period of time that it's this in-between state, switching on and switching off, there, there can be a lot of power dissipation there. So we have to keep that in mind. <coughs> but the capacitors and stuff sort of help buffer against that? They're, they'll help. But, but the thing is that what, when, I, when I talk about the power dissipation, uh, I mean in the transistor itself that's doing the switching mm -hmm. and so the transistor when when it when it goes to say uh, switch on you you have it going from zero power that it's transferring all the way to max power and so when you go to the max then then the component is not dissipating much power but when it's in between there there there's a uh, a power differential and, 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 and because that voltage has to go somewhere and what we're actually talking about this this curve that we're looking at you see it says on the side over here we're going from zero volts up to five volts so when it when it's halfway in between that means you're taking all of that power and let, let, let's say uh, as, as the, the leading edge of the pulse is rising so let's say it, it's rising and it's at the 2.5 volt level it hasn't quite reached the top then you have 2.5 volts is being dissipated here, but 2.5 volts is being dissipated somewhere else in, in the load. Mm -hmm. And so that, that extra 2.5 volts, that's, that can, can result in a lot of power that has to be dissipated mm -hmm. at that time. So that, that's where, um, in, in, anyway, we have to keep these in mind because that, that we have to size heat sinks for that and, and figure out how much power we're going to dissipate in the different components. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> All right, and uh, down below um, the next next slide, we've got Arduino PWM. Now the the Arduino we're we're going to be using this in uh, to cr control our pulse width modulation, and you can see the circuit below. Um, we have an Arduino. We show four or three connections on the bottom. We've got a ground, a plus five, and an A zero. And then at the top is a PWM output. Now the the ground and the plus five that, that's pretty obvious. Um, this this plus five this is actually an output from the Arduino. Uh, and the one thing I didn't show on here is that we're powering the Arduino from a uh, USB input, you know, just from a laptop or, or a USB power supply. So that's where it gets its its power from, and that's how the Arduino is able to output five volts to the potentiometer. Coming so, in at five as well. Pardon? What does it come in as? Well, it, yeah, it comes in as five volts. Mm -hmm. Does this um, a, a laptop a normal USB power for these things? It it um, allows. I think the USB spec out of a laptop and that kind of thing. It says it'll produce uh, five volts at uh, five hundred milliamps. That's one half of an amp. <coughs> now, now you can get wall adapters that'll charge faster. You know, they'll they'll go up to two point one amps. And so you can charge your phone faster. But anyway, I dig digress. But back up to like, what what are you doing there? Why do you have a pot there? Yeah, the the potentiometer, and we call it pot for short. 
uh, that that potentiometer that's going to give us adjustment so you see the, the potentiometer we have plus five volts on one side and ground on the other and then we have a wiper in the middle so the wiper can uh, give a, a reference signal to the A0 input to the Arduino. That A0, that stands for analog pin number zero. And so what that does, that can go all the way from the zero volts on the ground to the five volts on, at the peak. Oh, there he is. Hi there. Voila. Good morning. Well, it's morning here. <laughs> Good afternoon. It's already five o'clock here, sir. Okay, well, uh, we are in the instructional for the PWM power control. Can can y'all go ahead and pull it up? Uh, you the instructional for? It's called PWM power control. So we're doing the Arduino power electronics today. Uh, maybe, are you guys going to stay on this call for a little bit, or what are, what are you guys up to? Because we wanted to... First, get an update from where you are, because you guys hid into a hole somewhere, and uh, we want to see where you are. Uh, we're trying to tackle one printer issue after another. Uh, there have been some problems with RAM scores and Arduino boards uh, replacements. Uh, now we got uh, yeah one printer doing very nice prints from Unai, and uh, the other ones uh, were yeah. We had good results, and it, but it's very, uh, it's not consistent. Sometimes it does a, a, a good print, sometimes it doesn't, so we're trying to figure that out. Uh, we're printing some uh, plotter holders for the moment, and we want to do uh, the plotter later. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, is changing uh, one of the extruders uh, parts so it can help uh, hold the plotter pen. And uh, yeah, that's like one, one thing we want to finish today. So, do you guys want to stay for this Arduino? We're, we're like in the middle of it. We're, we are recording it so you guys can review it. We're just pretty much started on Arduino power control. Do you guys want to listen to that? Because the other thing is we can do is help you guys troubleshoot because um, I can probably tell you exactly what to do if you have extruder problems and all of that. Like we can get granular and really solve all of that. Do you have the time to do both, or do you want to do one, or what are you thinking? Uh, well, I, maybe we should uh, watch the recording about the Arduino afterwards, and if we have further questions, we can ask them uh, through mail or uh, the next talk that we have. Yeah. Because now we'll, I, su I suggest we, we focus on... Uh, yeah, getting the printers uh, all running and doing the plotter, like those stages. Uh, have you done the drilling yet? No, we haven't done the drilling. Last night we got we built the strip board Arduino and got that you working. Got yeah, 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 it's amazing. So. Well, did you use the, the fritzing design I sent you or uh, another? I saw that it was like a LED and uh, the button added. Yeah, we, we took that. Uh, most of it was good. Uh, we changed a couple of things because um, we had to add the USB to serial converter. We kind of decided that, okay, now that we understand where the pins go, we kind of put some components like in the most convenient location. So we kind of changed some stuff around. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, just just details. But yeah, we... Send, uh, send me the, the, the file also uh, and maybe uh, some but you, you documented it uh, on video or uh, we have did you do it yeah we do have a bunch of video like um, probably the best the most comprehensive is I took a took a step by step of when I was building it so I, I'll uh, I've got the an initial video there's some stuff on the Facebook already but I'll do a, like a sequence an explicit sequence so you have it you're not doing that today right you're gonna do that like tomorrow no, no, tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. Have, uh, yeah I would like to do it tomorrow yeah um, yeah so we can get the printer going and uh, start printing you already have like the, the drill holder uh, I think Chris Chris was gonna do that later today or something like that okay yeah. okay so that's another priority again 
Yeah, like the drill holder, not super priority. Like the, I think the biggest priority is get the plotter, get the DIY Arduino, and that's and that'll be really good. And then you can yeah. move on to some of the yeah. power electronics. Yeah. Yeah. The day after, and then uh, we have still two days to look uh, at the Raspberry Pi. Maybe not the full enclosure, but we can hook it up, um, put on software, uh, make it work. Yeah, yeah, we'll have four days on. Uh, so we're taking today to wrap up the power electronics and, and cordless welder. And then tomorrow we're going to start on the Raspberry Pi. But let's. Uh, Let's talk about what, what the issues are in terms of, so what are your main issues? Because that's useful to document all of this. Uh, and, you know, as we review these videos, we can... Okay, so let's take the extruder. Peter was the first one who got his printer running. Yeah. And uh, he did some uh, prints that went well. And then suddenly... I don't know what at which point the, the X axis didn't function anymore. No, it was because I did a large print. Yeah, well, I'm gonna. I'm gonna oh, yeah. Wait. Yeah, uh, and I can explain. Yeah, uh, so I was doing. Uh, I think Don created a, a pen holder together with um, um, the, the extruder cooling uh, uh, thing with the pen holder. I tried to print that. But it was quite a large piece, and after it finished, uh, the head, uh, the printer had dropped on um, on the belt of the x-axis, and I think there was some movement there, and I think that messed up uh, the board basically. And after that, the x-axis didn't work, and we replaced now both the um, ramps board and the Arduino board, and. The, the Arduino board that I changed um, also, yeah, was not right, and I just changed, uh, and now in my third Arduino board, and that one works well, I think. Mm -hmm. Now I'm about to test the printer, but I made a uh, Peter lock, uh, Peter with a capital and lock with uh, non-capital, uh, describes all the problems that we having basically the whole group here okay uh, you guys know the page called uh, guys take a look at on your side page wiki page named J just click J for the page name yeah uh, you know that yeah I'm gonna open it up like for example Peter log okay so I redirected that to small L on a log um, okay, yeah, let's yeah. take a look at that. I didn't have the formatting right, but I'm going to, uh, I would just want to jot it down. Uh, yeah, now. okay. Um, yeah, so, so, uh, what can we help with on our side here? You think you're... Yeah, so I think we're, you know, I don't know. Okay. Oh, for the moment, like... Uh, there's like new issues uh, we're uh, running into. Uh, wait, is it J? Okay, that's uh, January 2000 page. It's, uh, oh, right. Uh, 2020, okay. Um, I'm looking at the J page now. Um, Yeah. Uh, what, what are you suggesting? Uh, the next steps? Uh, maybe that's. So you're saying, do you also have some extruder issues, or? Well, mine, uh, my print had um, basically has a lot of uh, um, when threading. It, yeah, threading. When it moves, uh, it has to bridge uh, a gap and. Um, it mm -hmm. keeps on extruding, uh, so, so there are big lines in between, so the quality is not optimal, but... Um, yeah, there were some blobs and, and, uh, and threads when it goes to one, uh, to one point, from one point to another. Uh, but yeah, then the, the issues happened with the X-axis and the extruder, so Peter is trying to solve that now. Uh, yeah. And 
but it was also the the file, the messed up STL file. Yeah. Of, uh, the combined sensor holder, uh, pen holder. Uh, the, I looked at it in Blender and it was full of holes and gaps, so mm. I fixed it. And it before I couldn't print it on the on the only printers also. Now uh, it has printed fine, so maybe it was like part of the problem of the print going wrong. Yeah. So uh, we want to test that uh, yeah, when it's fixed. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Printed. Uh, yeah. When I had printed one on uh, on his printer. Uh, and it came out so the, the cleaned up file and it came uh, came out right. Okay. So, uh, that's promised. All right. But yeah, I, I suggest uh, we focus like now uh, a bit on the printers. Now we have like some of the plotter parts, and uh, yeah, then look at the plotter part uh, like uh, the code uh, generating the code with Inkscape. I think that's pretty well documented by you guys. Yeah, yeah, it's relatively decent there. Yeah. As you go yeah, along, you know, make, think, make improvements, yeah. It would yeah. be like uh, easy in comparison to getting uh, the extruder and stuff. I think so. so. Pen, work. Yeah. Uh, what about like, are you having some other extrusion problems or are you pretty good? Uh, for the rest, I think... Um, well, look at the, can you see inside the camera? Uh, wait, I'm gonna, gonna put on the camera for a second. Okay. So you're saying you messed up the electronics when you rammed into the the surface and then you were just putting a lot of resistance on the electronics? Uh, oh, oh, there. So okay. I think so, so this is what Unai printed now. So okay. it looks pretty decent up until here, actually. So this is not quite is it? right, I think. Mm. Well, well, I'm not sure if you have to bridge that, uh, so All right, yeah. has to close that hole. Huh? Yeah, so, and with my printer, I think uh, it, the, 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 the print that dropped in this, let me see, uh, show it, dropped here, so this was, uh, the belt was resting on this, and I think it tried to move the x-axis for a while or something, and it couldn't do so, so probably that messed up. Uh -huh. x-axis movements yeah and that was uh, that was on the rams board that was uh, so then peter changed the rams board okay. uh and uh, and the drivers also and the drivers yeah yeah and uh, it, it functioned again so yeah but first no. he changed the driver and it didn't work it's no. only after he changed the rams board that it uh, started working again so something got fried uh, again uh, but then there was an extruder uh, problem, uh, and that couldn't be fixed with uh, changing the RAMS board. So then he changed the Arduino. Uh, the Arduino board, something wrong with it also. So he changed it again, and now it's functioning. I hope. So what what caused it? That's like still a mystery to us. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are you using the well, controllers? So all the controllers that I sent you, which I sent five, they're all tested, so they all work. No, 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 Did uh, they? Are you using them? Four. Okay, four. Well, we, uh, we're using four, and Peter is using one of those. Okay. Uh, well, it was one of those. Now it's replaced by the the boards that I ordered. Uh, that I ordered myself. Okay. So we got out the diode. We adapted it to four. Yeah. Uh, we did it before for the board uh, of uh, Beber. Uh, he's uh, he's using one of my boards that, that is adapted and uh -huh. adapted for 24 volts. Seems to work. Yeah. Um, so yeah. 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 We don't know what caused the, the, the burnout. So uh, I hope uh, we get. Well, I, mean, I think so. I was measuring the, the voltage of the drivers. And I think I messed up there. I accidentally plugged the minus into a plus or something and you smoked the sparks out. So I, I think I fried it. But it was still working afterwards, but then at some point it stopped. So probably that was the main cause. Yeah. But, um, uh, do you have any of those uh, ceramic small, small screwdrivers so that you don't cause short circuits there? 
Like for oh for me just for measuring you're saying during measurement you you measured wrong? Uh, yeah. It was during measurement. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It was just a voltage meter that I think I, I plugged it accidentally in the plus instead of the minus for the ground and then yeah, something could, happens. Yeah, some short circuiting through that process. Yeah, it's possible. You might have hit two things. Yep. Um, yeah. What about any extruder issues that you ha guys have right now? Or are you, all your extruders, besides, I mean, the, the stringing, that will be by calibration of retraction. So uh, if one of you has internet, you can go, okay, calibration, extrusion calibration file and run a test print, change the retraction value. Right now we have like 2.5 millimeters. It should probably be like much larger since we're using really fat nozzles. You wanna suck it up more so you're not extruding. Uh, if 2.5 is good for like 0.4 millimeters, I mean, we could probably expect like, you know, seven millimeter retraction or something to work well, better, or p perfectly mm -hmm. fine. Yeah, that we, we have the same issue. We just haven't uh, corrected that so much. Um, yeah, but otherwise, like mechanically, are your extruders aligned? Do you have good alignment? You put in a piece of filament into the hole and then locate the cooling block with a filament inside? The, the well, heat, heat break? That's all yeah. good? Okay. Yeah, we had, uh, we had uh, that when I was printing something and uh, it, uh, the bearing shifted, uh, we suppose, because the, the filament gets uh, got like uh, next to the, the bearing, so there wasn't uh, any uh, tension anymore. So it was like printing in midair, uh, printing nothing. But that, that solved. Uh, and he did like the best print yeah, up until yeah. now. This one's working. This uh, so yeah, we, we're we're getting there one step at a time, but it's uh, it ain't easy. Yeah. And overall, how <clears throat> how is your morale? Did you lose all hope, <laughs> or how are you guys doing over there? No, and I think 11.30 in the evening we go home or something, so it's really more than 12 hours working there, so we're working very hard on this. But, uh, right, and, yeah, we we're still, we're still pretty motivated and sometimes we have like uh, drawbacks, but uh, we, do, do, uh, we do make steps in the right direction, so that's, uh, that's keeping up our, our morale. Yeah. And that's good. I think we all have, a, we're gonna get there. Yeah. It's unfortunate that we drastically behind schedule and the other stuff is, uh, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking like uh, we we won't be able to do the the whole curriculum. That's uh, that's for sure. But we I would like to do like the major parts still. Like if we could make the Arduino board tomorrow, um, do the plotting. Yeah. With uh, with some luck, building. Uh, some people would like to uh, etch a PCB, maybe not make a, a, full, a complete uh, board after it, but just like the procedure yeah, that's, uh, of, the, uh, of etching, yeah. uh, like the drilling and the, the drawing the circuit and then yeah. etching it, that would be, be fun. That would be uh, nice if, yeah. I think we, we score very high on this uh, global literacy thing because I think all of us now now know how to uh every component of the printer we can build and we we know how to everybody knows how to upload new firmwares and changing pins and from from extruder to extruder adapting the, the firmware yeah. has been done uh, like uh, changing oh. the extruder outputs uh, we're, we're changing the g start and end g codes of the profiles of cura and so printing we got it down it's just wow. the printers yeah <laughs> us a bit down. oh <laughs> wow okay okay um, you needed to remap the the different stepper drivers because they burned out, so you wanted to use the spare one. Yeah. So uh, my okay. uh, so I uh, so my extruder zero didn't work anymore, so I wanted ah. to try whether the E one port works. Yeah. I mean, remap the pins. Ah. Okay. And then it. Uh, started yeah. So yeah. That's power. Yeah, that's power user stuff, actually. Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, yeah, do document that, and it's documented some, somewhere like on the initial 
But yeah, document yeah. what you've done and upload it. On my log, so. Okay. Excellent. No, that's good. That's good that you're learning it inside out. Yeah, but that's not uh, We changed uh, on one of the printers, the, the, uh, the Zipro didn't register. And uh -huh. then they remapped it in firmware that the, the minus, they made uh, a minus from the, the maximum pins. They remapped it also. You mean to a different... So, uh, from Z min to Z max. What? You remapped it from Z min. A pins to Z max. Okay, I've never done that. Okay, all right, and that still worked. Uh, okay, so you have to change. I think the the, the origin uh -huh. of the problem was that we were running on twenty four volts, putting twenty four volts into the board, and then this pin kind of fried. Uh, yeah. I guess the other printers, um, or the other two printers also, we also ran it on 24 at the beginning, yeah, but, but they survived, but this one board looks like, uh, that's the hypothesis, that fried and yeah, that's, or just one pin fried. Right? And then we so the sensors seem to work pretty well uh, on 5 volts. They do huh. come a little bit closer than the 8 millimeters. Maybe, okay. Yeah, they, they have to like, be on 6 millimeters maybe to, uh, to make the switch. I don't know. That's because of the five volts, huh. but it does uh, does it consistently. So. Okay. Uh, uh huh. Okay. Well, that's good to know that they'll still work, even though they're supposed to work at a higher voltage. Yeah. Are you running it some? Goes up. What? Are you running some printers on twelve volts? No, no, no. It's all on twenty-four. Right, because you don't have a twelve volt power supply, really. Right, we got no. the 24s. Right, okay, great. And now also just you know just to keep the morale up, um, I mean you guys, the, the, the thing about the Steam Camp is that it's only the beginning. First of all, this is our first one of this nature. And we're gonna keep improving this until the schedule gets really, really tight. We've got everything much more documented, but also, We'll continue the different development session. Like for example, in the future Steam camps, you guys are welcome. Um, if Michelle, you're okay. I mean, let the guys come again if they want to to do some of the other experiments. We are going to have the next Steam camp on March 8 for the four-day version. So if you guys are in the in the near area, you should definitely come in. But it's basically you know getting a whole network of people like us where we're constantly developing the curriculum and so forth. Like Jessica here, for example, she'd like to run an event in Boston even next time. I mean, she's really picking up a lot of stuff, and um, so that's really good. I think the community is building, and, and we definitely invite everybody to continue. And just because you didn't do it now, either do it later from documentation, and as you do it, just keep making improvements. Because, once again, this is about collaborative design. And... Like, you don't have to, you know, carry the whole burden on yourself. In fact, like, when you guys are doing all of this... Uh, I hope uh, we can to work together uh, as, as a team here in Europe uh, in, the, in the future. We have been talking a lot, like, during uh, lunch and dinner about uh, versioning, uh -huh. uh, version control on the 3D files, and uh, a lot of ideas are going around. Yeah. Uh, Peter and Holger have... Uh, a lot of experience in, in, in software and uh, that stuff, so yeah, I uh, I think it uh, will uh, lead to major improvements in the in the future. Yeah, no, that's that's but great. We, yeah, we should look into into versioning. Uh, there, there has been uh, like quite some confusion about uh, yeah certain parts and, and uh, certain assemblies and yeah yeah. Has to, we, we should. Like uh, with, with Git, you have a, ma a master branch that isn't uh, changed immediately, um, uh, and then you have like side branches or forks. People work on improvements, uh, try out stuff. If it's uh, an improvement, we merge them yeah. after uh, after evaluation by uh, by uh, by a few people by a team, and that way we always have like. Uh, um, a stable, a stable version. Yeah. A stable version 
and, and daily uh, daily versions. Yeah. Uh, like you have a software development, uh, yeah, alpha and beta. Something. Uh, yeah. Well, something we should look into that, that uh, to avoid uh, confusion uh, about uh, certain parts. How does that integrate with part libraries on the wiki? We can have, for example, like git control on, like within those library parts. That would that would be one one way to do it. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that. Um, so I think um, what we could do is uh, perhaps. Uh, so I think what we are generating with OSE is um, not 3D printers, but we're creating documentation for creating 3D printers. Yeah. And the wiki is a large, large uh, collection of all this information, but it's especially, I think for all of us here, it's really difficult to find our way on the wiki and uh, also uh, for example, for the D3D Universal webpage, not everything is uh, consistent. So this led to yeah. us having a different design for the access, for example. Um, but I was thinking if we could have a workflow with Git and then have something like a make file. And uh, so Git tracks all the commits on it. So you, you already have a work log, basically. And if you run the make file, it generates a, um, yeah. a wiki page for you with all the documentation in one place that is consistent over all the versions. And with Git, you can also have sub-modules. So you can take the firmware um, as a sub-module in the D3D Universal re repository, for example, and you can make sure that uh, that the firmware for the D3D and for the D3D Pro, for example, always stays in sync. And uh, yeah, I was thinking about that, but but this could be an idea, so that much more of the wiki becomes auto-generated how do you, for users. But how do you auto-generate wiki pages? You generate it in a Git software and then just copy and paste that into the wiki, or how do you automate that? Well, so uh, you would need to uh, write a program to generate it, basically. But it's it's just text in essence. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So I. So I, you I, you auto generate it and then copy and paste that into the wiki. Well, yeah. Maybe there is also some way to automate that the part. uploading as well. Yeah. And then so well, that's good. Uh, so, so let me give feedback on that. So that's awesome for power users, but also remember that, so while we may be comfortable with Git, or you guys may all be comfortable with it or, or to certain levels, we still need an entry point for a person that is not familiar any with the Git workflows. So things that are more of the wiki nature like Wikipedia, where somebody can go to an article and get information readily without them having to do that. So we always... It, the answer would be both. Like, yes, we want to have this for development, but also for people who are contributors. Like, for example, in an incentive challenge that we do in a cordless drill, we don't want to have the requirement of the, you know, say some fabricator guy who runs a, a fab shop. We can't require him to learn Git to be able to participate in our collaborative development. So that's the other requirement. We can have this, yes, but it would have to be both. We'd have to have another interface where people can readily collaborate like that's why i'm suggesting this simple very simple kind of uh, part library workflows merge workflows uh, for cad files and so forth where uh, we do it more manually and in a simpler way and then we can still have managers that do that in official workflows like the git workflows but we cannot forget that this is about low barriers to entry for anybody as well so when, when you guys think about this no, make sure you keep that in mind yeah. Yeah. So, but this this was the idea. So the wiki is, I think. Well, I I have problems with it, but uh, I'm I guess too nerd for a Wikipedia. But um, but um, so I think the wiki page can still be an entry uh, place where normal users can add things. But uh, so, but if parts of it are also auto generated with all the files in a zip file or something. And, yeah. Um, yeah. 
Uh, the wiki page is basically then the barrier between the power users with using Git and the normal users with uh, that just use the wiki. Yeah. So yeah, that, that was basically my. No, that's that sounds great. Yeah, if we could if, if we could implement that, that would be great. People can contribute, uh, but as long as you don't like master um, uh, free cats and. Um, understand certain designs uh, in depth you can yeah try to contribute you can suggest things but you shouldn't like uh, be able to uh, interfere with the stable version also yes like that could be a buffer like uh, yeah you can suggest things like make a branch or uh, in a certain way even if it's not in git like make a uh, yeah. post things on your log or whatever uh suggest them. and then other users who are more familiar can add them to stable to the stable branch. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, if they're good. Yep, yep, definitely, so, definitely. Yeah, can, but but the one can be combined. Yeah, Michelle, the the one thing that you you're going to need for that kind of setup is you need a, a, somebody who's a responsible manager to to be looking after all that and keeping the links straight and all the versions up to date. I mean, it, it takes maintainers, so yeah. it boils down to maintainers who yep. can do that. Yeah. Yep. But that's yeah. the same same for the wiki. I mean, it's like it is because I mean, there's really like not really a lot of maintainers on a wiki right now. I'm like I'm like the only guy that knows where everything is on it. Is, um, is, is anybody is anybody volunteering? Is that what I hear? Yeah, of course, of course, we all are. So, okay. Well, that sounds really good. And then. And I also had another suggestion. Yeah. So, I think uh, what 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 went wrong is that uh, with, with our layout of the x-axis for the universal, was that basically in between that Michel made the printer in the summer or so, or yeah. Yeah. Well. And now it was kind of a major uh, yeah. uh, a major change. Of the layout of the axis, it has lots of um, ramifications for, for well, where just the zero 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 point is, for example. Right. And I, so in uh, software development, we have something that's called uh, semantic versioning. Uh, there is a very nice website about it. It's called semfer.org. and um, so it it basically tells you how major uh, new releases so from 1.0.0 to 2.0.0 is a completely different printer in this case for example and uh, but from 1.2.1 to 1.2.2 is only a minor change so it's it's usually a software a bug fix and well for a printer it would be fixing an issue that is basically bugging you for example a sensor that is replaced with another sensor that is better or something, and um, um, yeah, and this with the semantic version you can keep better track of how severe a change is, and uh, because I think now it's basically 1904 or something, meaning 2019 April, but the development rate of OSE is so incredibly fast that a couple of months can make a huge difference in in the machines and. Oh, December, 14th, December. even a couple of days, yeah, and this is not reflected in the uh, version uh, number, so yeah, maybe a suggestion is to adopt the semantic versioning uh, system for all the uh, mm -hmm. hardware. Maybe yeah. I think I'm, I'm just... Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I think uh, you have a great point. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. Now it's based on the, the year and the, and the month. Maybe we should add the day also. <laughs> you can. I mean, that's that's the point of that thing. We can we can do that. Uh, but yeah, we can. Let's see how we can. Make that happen. No, that's a good point. Like, is, yeah. Okay, good suggestion. Uh, I have one. To, we don't have to start from a zero point one point one. We can use a uh, year and month like they do in uh, sometimes like a software development like Ubuntu uh, 16. Yeah, they, they do it, but 
usually software uses uh, semantic versioning. Yeah, and that's yeah. That, that's that starts from zero. Kind of, yeah, and and uh, yeah, zero point. Uh, usually, a version starts in zero point one dot zero, and yeah. everything that it starts with a zero is in incubation phase. That means it's not a full release. It's not. You you should not expect something from it. And uh, as soon as you're ready to. Basically, perhaps the Universal and the Pro, they are being sold now on the website, so maybe this is the time that it becomes 1.0, for example. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, so you have also a very nice way to notify users that it's still an incubation phase of a, a particular machine. Yeah. So that's also a benefit of semantic versioning. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, add that to the wiki and see if, you know, start implementing it and see, see how it works. Yeah, and I have a question on, so one, one other item is, there was some discussion, Benedict, about the P, P2P Foundation stuff, there's a lot of different efforts for micro factories happening, kind of like for economic development in Europe, can you fill me in on that, and, and for me, like, uh, the comment I make is that we want to make sure that the open source is clear and a clear value that they're promoting, because I, I see that the basically like the p2p licenses they all miss that point and any comments on that as far as the latest thing and are there any people that we can actually collaborate with because they are open source and they're generating open source design like if there are so many different efforts in europe happening that are producing uh, public design is it true or is it still proprietary uh, any comments on that <coughs> Yeah, um, I mean, think of precious plastic. Uh, yeah. You know that? Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I would say they, they produce open source. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, That's hardware. good. Um, and yeah, there's there's a lot of others, um, especially the francophone uh, yeah. countries, I think, have, have uh, a lot that they're kind of um, in their own ecosystem uh, uh -huh. within their French language, I think. But um, uh, we're getting there to, to make their to, uh, to have more synergies with them, but it's um, yeah there's yeah we were working on that within the Fab City uh, initiative. Um, so uh, yeah, the thing is um, to have I would say the the the, um, the, the challenge is to to uh, to have one. Um, Platform where you uh, collaborate on uh, designs, so so you don't uh, invent a 3D printer uh, two times, you know, or yeah. develop two 3D printers, but you only have one which everybody works on. So that's that's where I think the challenge to um, just to, for example, to to um, to, to get the Fab City um, Foundation, which is the, the head of um, the all Fab City initiatives, uh, to um, Say okay, we uh, we have this platform, and we encourage our all the makerspaces that are engaged with our movement to use uh, this platform and develop the the um, open hardware um, that is on this platform. So, um, but yeah, that's that's the, the current stand, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is Fab City is that organized by by the Fab Labs? Or that's different. Um, it's it's uh, yeah it's, it has come out of that. Um, in 2014, Barcelona became the um, first Fab City, and that was uh, an idea of Thomas Diaz and Neil Gershenfield. Um, and since that, um, they have made their own organization, uh, Fab City Foundation, and it's uh, 34 cities uh, globally. Um, until last year, and now this year again, some cities are joining. And um, yeah, the, I mean, the interesting thing here is that the government, uh, in order to become a Fab City, City Hall needs to uh, agree on um, becoming a Fab City. So you have the government uh, on your side. So they they know about you, and they are uh, maybe willing to to support you in, um, in any way. So. But uh, yeah, I mean, what what my view, what is missing is um, more collab uh, collaboration uh, in the designs. I mean, there's too many different things happening, too many silos, you know. Right. Uh, too many different ecosystems. 
existing next to each other. So the question is, how can you merge them and uh, create synergies? So yeah, but and then then even a bigger question: Can you show me their first single open source design that they've produced? Do they have anything right now? Is there anything we can use? Yeah, sorry. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Uh, do we have a, a single open source design that they have produced and released? I've, I've looked at it and I can't find anything. I think I looked, looked at it and there's some non-commercial stuff, but that's not open source. So how do we get them to understand the distinction between non-commercial and open source? That's, that to me is one of the big barriers there. They, they don't get it. You so whom are you talking about now? Uh, well, the Fab City, well, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Fab City, like uh, Fab Labs and Fab City, like like. There's a lot of Fab Labs stuff. There's a lot of closed source stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's. I think the clarity has to start with. Okay, we're gonna make things open source. Otherwise, we're just seriously limiting the the collaboration potential. Like I don't think that's that's cent central to their platform. Um. And but I'm, and my my yeah, simple see, question they, is they don't have a platform. Yeah. yeah, they don't even have a one platform. That's the first thing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, like we'd love to get in there, but I mean, I'm I'm asking how because for that to happen, like they they would have to start by producing open source designs. Is there is there any that yeah, we can yeah, yeah, yeah. such as I mean, so they, such they, as where they're, they're not against that. Um, I guess there's just. Uh, different or misunderstandings, I would say. Um, and I mean, there's makerspaces within, they're, they're not heavily organized, you know, if, you, if you're uh -huh. a makerspace within a web city, then it doesn't mean that everything changes for you, but you just continue what you have done before. And this is just uh -huh. uh, developing. Uh, so yeah. if we have, um, but but I think if the uh, what you have been talking about with Peter, um, if you managed really to uh, develop this, then uh, you, many different um, things can happen at the same time and still be effective in the end. So that would be a first step. And then I can say, at least for Hamburg, that we can then, for example, bring in, uh, encourage our schools to um, include this into the, their curricula um, to, to let uh, students try to, uh, to download the designs and build it and stuff like that. Yeah. But for that, you need um, some somehow a collaborative uh, platform for that where you, where you can manage to um, yeah that is good organized in a good way so just what you have been talking about with Peter yeah okay yeah 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 let's see what let's see what happens there uh, who's like the leader of the fab city initial initiative Who, who's like is there a leader uh, that's, the, that's the fab city foundation <clears throat> and um, there's uh, that's that is a um, combination well, that is an initiative by um, the P2P lab. Um, maybe you know Vasilis Kostakis. Um, uh -huh. The P2P lab is um, kind of similar to the P2P foundation. Uh, they're uh, a spin-off from uh, the P2P foundation and the and Italian Technical University, and they're publishing papers and but also are uh, activists. So they're in there, then it's um, the Fab Foundation, which is the uh, head of all the Fab Labs, or the foundation behind all the Fab Labs, uh, the, the infrastructure. And it's, um, I think, the some something from Barcelona. Um, mm -hmm. I think the um, Ar uh, Advanced Ar Center for Architecture or something like that. But yeah. anyways, yeah. If, like the, the head, I would say, who also initiated is um, Thomas Diaz. Yes, like if you can convince him for anything, then you have. Yeah, I tried. I tried. I didn't succeed. I would say. Um, yeah, the first thing that has to happen is is uh, license non ambiguity. There's, there's, the licenses are completely ambiguous right now. Like there's the like if we talk about the agents who who you mentioned, I mean they're so they're into the peer production licenses, which are not open source. So we got to start an open source license. That's that's my feedback on this. Um, so if, if when you you know when you operate in this field, yeah, try to you know try to push that discussion. But I mean, I kind of tried to, to get this, but I, I'm not getting anywhere on that with uh, some of the people that you mentioned. So 
So you're saying there's not an open source license? Correct. Is, uh, am I right? Did I yes, that yes, that, that is that correct. Is your uh, opinion, or no, it's not an opinion. That's there is not an open source license that they're that they're pursuing or or endorsing. They're on one side they have P two P, the the peer production licenses which are not open source, and uh, whenever I pu push this question, they say yes, we we support it, but we don't require it. Well, we need some clarity on that. Because otherwise, you're going to keep creating silos with license incomp incompatibility. So, that's 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 my discussion. Um, that's that's what I'm trying to say. So, so uh, how, how would um, a open source license um, lead to compatibility? Uh, so well, so we have to. Uh, what you're saying that is that there should be. Um, hmm? Yeah, an open source license means that that you're Are allowing you open source license. Okay, can you can you then make Yes. Sorry, you, did you cut out or? I can't uh, connection. Could you repeat it? Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying that that yeah, we need to start with an open source license. An open source license allows economic freedom. That's one of the four freedoms of an open source license. And it has to be upfront, in my view, for this to succeed. Otherwise, we're not able to collaborate. Like, okay, they disconnected or we disconnected. Um, yeah, so anyway, I mean, this is, this is, you guys are listening to this? I mean, this is the kind of, this is where we're at in a state of open source. Um, I think a lot of people are not. That's what they were just talking about. That picture. yeah, mm -hmm. like so. For example, Benedict is not really aware. He is an open source advocate, but he's not really aware that there's a, a license issue at play here too. Mm -hmm. But that is, you cannot have this license ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Like, if you are going to collaborate, you have to select a license which allows for universal collaboration. Otherwise, you're still contributing to the silos. So. OSC's mission is, okay, it's collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. Inclusive, that's a word we use, that is important. We cannot be excluding a certain agents because they don't follow our philosophy. We're neutral, we, we're saying we're just going to collaborate on everything and mm -hmm. people have the economic freedom to make a livelihood from what we generate. For example, in a peer production license, uh, you have to be part of the collective in order to to benefit from it. That's exclusive. Yeah, mm. yeah. You can't. Uh, that's we can't do that. Like if uh, if we were to work together, and we're open source, mm. and they have the peer production license, uh, we can't, because mm. it, it's not. Can't do it. Like there's issues in, sometimes with software licenses. Um, uh, we have to come up start with by okay we're on the same page as far as who owns the products that we do it's like it's a governance issue mm -hmm. who owns this stuff at the end of the day and we're saying everybody owns everybody. it mm -hmm. yeah so i mean these kind of points i mean uh we gotta get really clear on this to go forward and, and that clarity is not there uh, so, so that's that's kind of what i'm trying to say here and that's what's preventing a lot of this awesome collaboration from happening because people are not of, really catching of all of the participants in this camp, yeah. Who needs to really be concerned about that concept? So ben, we were talking to Benedict, and he's getting in, involved in that. Um, he's he's bringing that up. So that's a discussion for him. I just want to make sure he understands because he's like not getting, uh, not understanding that that issue is at play. So I just wanted to bring bring that point out since we we're discussing what their status is because they start talking about all the initiatives in Europe, how we collaborate with them to get mm -hmm. STEAM camps, to get this material into schools. He's from uh, Hamburg where I actually gave a lecture a few years ago and they're in, they have a lot of initiative there for yeah, the really open cool source yeah. work. But we have to start on the right foot. We cannot start on a bad foundation and no, things are going to collapse. My, my point is uh, in an organization, regardless of what their corporate structure or revenue goals or whatever, you have people that are driving towards you know, high-level strategic goals that are long-term you know, planning. You have operations people that facilitate the things that 
happen at a then more tactical level. Yeah. So of those three sort of categorical jobs or mentalities or um, skill sets, mm-hmm. I think it's a, you, you are all now at the point where you're gathering enough visibility and participation that you need to kind of have a lens of uh, who are these various people that are coming on board, where can they fit in one of these buckets? Because not everyone is going to have the perspective, much less the raw skills, to contribute to all of them. You happen to, but because this is sort of your baby, you've been nurturing this all along, you have all these contacts all over the world, you also know the very you know raw technical um, skills that go into it. Um, assuming that other people are going to have that capability could be a mistake. So... I've developed some of these. I'm probably stronger in the tactical and operational, but not super strong in the long-term strategy. Um, I'm not, I don't care, I don't care. I'm not as focused in like the long-term licensing or the like very specific revenue model that is gonna be required under the OSE sort of brand to keep things sort of going, right? That Those are things that you're thinking about. You have mentors that are helping you sort of craft that strategy. But that is a very different question than thinking about how do we keep a single source of truth of a G-code test file to print a plotter attachment, right? So those are very different yeah. perspectives. And so for these different camps, I think it's it's useful to sort of keep an eye out for who can play a role on an ongoing basis in one of these, you know, different sort of levels of contribution. What are they innately interested in? Um, and encourage that and steer them, you know, into that, give them, you know, breadcrumbs to keep sort of going down that rabbit hole and getting more intrinsically motivated in it. Um, but also not giving them too much of things that they maybe don't need. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because you all are really at the moment where there are lots of different things that need to scale at a tactical level, at an operational level, as well as a strategic level. Yeah. And it's going to take, you know, identifying who is going to own some of these processes and creating, you know, product owners, essentially, that they're responsible for this. They're going to have a team of some kind and they're gonna run with this in a more structured, organized way, and they may need to build some tooling just to simply allow them to do that. Yeah. Right? Hey, Don, Don, let me ask you one thing, and this is gonna be key to all this, is that we, we've had some some uh, ownership, some people would take ownership of something for a while, and then, then they move on to something else in, in life. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, it, how important is it to have a person doing that as opposed to having a role that you can define and so anybody can come along and help with that role? So, that's definitely true. I mean, having a role defined is the beginning of it because you have to simply be able to articulate what is required to do this, what is the potential time requirement um, to contribute to this on a monthly basis even. Um But, you know, that really just kind of comes down to, like, agile principles. You have to define what your goals are, uh, who is, who are the sort of development team members required, and what is their capacity. And then you can sort of plot, like, how much velocity do you really expect to achieve in, you know, a unit of time, whether it's a two-week sprint or a month-long, just sort of continuous, um, integration or you know development process um so the churn concept is something that you will probably deal with for a while until you can somehow uh incentivize people to stay on longer than they might just under their own willpower Mm -hmm. um i think part of that is going to come down to facilitating them doing their own trainings to provide additional income on their own that keeps them in this same world but still stimulates some financial incentive to do something so that they're creating revenue uh, by their own 
entrepreneurial stuff. Entrepreneurial mm -hmm. element of what they're already doing within this larger umbrella of OSC, mm -hmm. right? So the, the more they do their job at a sort of product owner level, they're pushing the bounds. Now they have more structure or curriculum or content or products to do <coughs> in this separate entrepreneurial space. So it sort of is a symbiotic relationship, but the more they contribute to this direction, it ends up helping this side over here. How, how would you see um, a way that OSE could like get people to participate with OSE, but yet find something in, in the OSE to make a living from, so they could have a vested interest in, in mm -hmm. helping bring OSE forward? Um, I mean, I, we're, I'm think, just trying to think about how do you put those together to make that happen. Yeah. Who, who's joining us? Everyone's still on. Oh, great. Um, so I think the, the, the node models that we already have of, you know, training revenue and ideally just production, you know, goods or services revenue is going to be, uh, a big part of that. Mm. So what is the easiest way to accomplish that goal out of the gate, right? Is giving them a product, I said giving, you know, somehow having them acquire a production ready printer with a catalog of products that they can just, they have this process and tool chain that they can just crank stuff out, even if it's very basic, right? Yeah. It's a bucket. Mm. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, print 30 buckets and sell them for $5 a piece or, you know, whatever the sort of the revenue model is, but allow them to have this somewhat passive income that they're just sort of printing money mm -hmm. in the form of plastic, right? Yeah. Um, if we can maybe chop up this steam training into some smaller, easier to perfect modules that they can then do, you know, in charge whatever for mm -hmm. on a one to two day, you know, basis, that will help them create some additional revenue. And so, um, that incentivizes all of the rest of us because we'll also have the ability to do those same things, but incentivizes all the rest of us to perfect um, the outcome, not just the physical product quality, but the outcome of those training experiences, the outcome of the products that we're building, um, because we are all also financially incentivized to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the conversations about, you know, licensing and this, that, and the other, whatever, is, is a good sort of narrative to keep going, um, but there's really only a small subset of the collective of us that really need to be worried about that on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month level. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a... In, in my mind, I mean, that's a sort of high-level, you know, long-term planning narrative that, yes, impacts everyone, but you kind of have to pick and choose whose mental energy, you know, whose knowledge cycles should really be applied to that. Um, who has the contacts to contribute to that? Who has the time to think about that? You know, who has um, the sort of public speaking experience to potentially go out and you know create some narratives and visibility you know around that right so so that that's part of the deal that's kind of what my the crux of the question is is that you know is it first of all open source model doesn't lend itself one to one to the way commercial things operate and, and um yeah you know it does I would challenge some of that yeah well I mean you, what, you know, what, whether this is tied to an LLC or a corporation or you know whatever. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to knowledge work. So this is a sort of group or organization that just as an outsider who does software development, who does software project planning, is in sort of dire need of an expert sort of project planner and distilling goals into smaller chunks that can be put on 
a backlog of work, essentially. And then all of the different contributors who may invest 40 hours a month or four hours a month can pick off small modules of work to contribute to and submit that sort of knowledge work, whether it's a free CAD file or a sort of test um, round of something that we want to make sure this really works the way we think it does, um, can submit that work sort of back to the project to say, hey, I did this tiny chunk, here is the you know result. We can update the project based on you know, this little bit that I've done. But all of that requires someone to curate this work and to right. manage a backlog right. and to make sure that we're not just saying, hey, we need to build this thing, but we have you know some defined requirements um, that are more thoughtful uh, than just, well, we need to be able to do X. Well, what what is the potential long term effects of doing X? You know, does it need to just do X in this sort of one scenario, or does it need to be able to do X a thousand times a day, or does it need to be able to do X like perfectly the first time in a training environment with people who are very non technical, who don't even know how to use tools very well? Um, so there's a, there's a lot of sort of just curation of even just what requirements should go into work before we even open a computer. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, <coughs> we're coming right up against the need for you know many maintainers, I think, and a lot of people who are getting really well versed in how these things work, but also have a mind uh, for what it means to maintain or curate this sort of backlog of work of sorts, whatever the sort of process we choose to do that um, would be natural maintainers and they can still sort of contribute to things um, as they you know have time but it's more likely that as we go along we're going to get a lot more participants who are contributors and not maintainers and so the people who start a, a sort of large process organization like this tend to be natural maintainers, at least at the beginning, until there's a very clear someone who comes along that says, hey, this is what I do for a living. I love doing this. Um, I would love to help you know, maintain some sliver. It, it'll be sort of very obvious that, hey, I'll maintain this because I love this. I'm not super technical in it, but I know the nature of how this works really well. Yeah. Or I know the requirements really well. I know who the people are they are going to need whatever this you know, output is. Yeah, but, but ultimately what, what I'm getting at is that when you, you start to grow the organization, you're going to need people full time doing this, mm -hmm. and they're going to need a financial incentive for yeah. them. You know, they need to be able to support themselves. Right. Absolutely. So, so we need that in the model. Absolutely. And I don't know, you know, enough about how OSE as an entity, you know, gets money to even. You see it right here. We bootstrap yeah. fund. We run events, and we sell some product. And so yeah, we're not on welfare. We're a bootstrapped organization. Right. Yep. Um, but you know, instead of trying to push the ball down the field, or push you know twenty balls down the field all at the same time, incrementally pushing one ball down the field, even if it's one yard at a time, with all of our sort of uh, combined effort, we can push one ball pretty far down the field to get to a point where there's some trickle money coming in that all of us can then do on a distributed scale, mm -hmm. right? So that we can have more individual sort of financial backing that allows us to contribute more iterative cycles towards pushing more balls down the field. But if we try to push too much down the field before we really have any revenue to back it, you know, we, we run into issues with churn and, you know, Sort of quality and experience sort of issues, I think that that are coming up. But I, I think if you have a, a more lucrative economic model, it, 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 you know, more more money there to be had, you can mm -hmm. get a lot more interest, a lot more people oh, sure. that are going to stick around, and you're going to get a lot more serious involvement. Right. And I think that's key to it. And I think it, that we need to build a, a business model into it, to where people can take these principles and do something to make a successful yeah. business for themselves. And maybe that's the first product, frankly. Oh, that sounds like the open source microfactory Steam Camp. <laughs> well, but you 
Yeah. Yeah. So, but the product, what is the product in the scene team? Education and production, uh, education experience, uh, training. It's a training program. I think you're it's right. Related I think what to you're products. saying is true. I think this is stuff that all needs to get worked out. But like for me, I'm a good example of someone sort of in between. I don't exactly have, you know, a lot of some some of this technical expertise in certain parts. Mm -hmm. But I can definitely make things, and I can definitely like, figure out how to do this stuff with mm -hmm. a little help from my friends. Well, that's <laughs> where the model starts to get really interesting. I think in the collaborative yeah. approach. Um, but I, I agree, like all the steps of actually making it work and realize right. is like the questions I'm asking myself, like I could ask these people and these people, mm -hmm. like would that, how would that look for me personally? Because mm -hmm. I do need to have some kind of economic, you know, yeah, thing going right. on more so than it is currently. But you develop but it, but that But it's also coming out of a desire of my, all, all the practice of my profession has been like, I need a model other than just being, you know, serving a client. The client, you know, I'm always, you know, we're serving a client with yep. the same. It's, I've, I've always been looking for a different model. Of yeah. That. So part of it is, it's going to be intrinsic to that the individual's uh, own just perspective on the world and how to engage with it. I think in terms of the interest and the commitment. But I, I, I agree, like, in, without the development of like a financial like, way to really keep engaging and a way for it to be financially feasible, it, you won't lose it. You lose uh, energy to keep kind of participating. So I mean, I think it's the questions you're bringing up are very much, you know, where it's, where it's being tested, it's being challenged mm -hmm. and being trying mm -hmm. to be worked out. Um, so as a thought experiment, what if you had marketed the Steam Camp differently? What if the end product was not education, it wasn't training, it wasn't these devices. The end product was a business model. You know, you, you learn to do these things, you understand the nature of what it means to teach, the bill of materials to do the experiments, the, you know, the, the level of sort of precision and guidance and time that's required to do these trainings. But the end product is a business model. It's a, you know, you can take this sort of documents of, here's what it means to generate money for yourself. Go home, look for a handful of these sort of categorically unique institutions or organizations or community elements and go, you know, sort of pitch them on, let me come and do something with you once a month um, and t teach your constituents or, you know, community these concepts and over time over the course of a year they will have learned x y z and it gets you know the benefits of that for them are a b and c so that that turns this whole experience very differently i think you and i sort of came to this already with that in mind yeah i think that's true mm -hmm. But that may but not necessarily. But I think that's true, and that's where it's sort of it is in a way it's a filter. Sort of like who are the people who are interested in developing that model, and who are are not. Like right. the guy, he, someone that Marcin knows in New York that was like, I can't do this. You know, like they they, they have other stuff going on. Oh, sad. But the but the um, it is yes, it's right. It's like it's who wants to do public who has that in their in their. Like, what sure. are they looking for? Well, right. well I, I think we need to also think about the, the products of OSE as being a little bit more than, than simply uh, education and documentation, but we need to also, the, the, the product that I th think we need to focus on is to make a poster child, uh, create a successful business model using open source. And, 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 and I'm Prove that this that works. I'm, I'm thinking not even within OSE, maybe Maybe and Jessica could go back and, and, and help her to implement and get this thing going so she can have an income, basically, be a, a open source income. Mm -hmm. You have to have a case study to show people that you can create income for yourself by producing things, by training people, by doing all these things. Or, or, or not even by, uh, what I'm getting, not, not just by uh, taking OSE educational materials and, and propagating that alone, but but to help people start businesses, right, and and to to maybe make power cubes or or, or yeah, to exactly. make 3D printers, right? Or take 3D printers and build something or mm -hmm. whatever it is. But yeah, but to help them uh, get a business and get it going, I think that's where we're going to see the fire catch on mm -hmm. for open source. When people mm -hmm. see this as a viable business model, they're going to jump on that bandwagon. They're yeah. going to say, "Look, I, I'm done with corporate America. I want this." And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Yeah. And so that was my whole goal really coming into this is like, I'm going to start a re recycling company. Uh, that's the lowest hanging fruit. Then I want to start a demolition company with all open source, you know, recognition. <coughs> It'll start with, you know, bobcats and different things, right? But I already have ends in some of these industries that they can feed me jobs, especially if, you know, they're small, they're quick, they don't require, you know, the most intensive of machinery. Um, or I can tack on to jobs and say, look, I'll do this other side work of this project that you have for pennies on the dollar. So just let me take my little margin on it because my equipment and overhead is so small that you can't afford to tell me no, right? Um, I like that, yeah. So, for better or worse, I already have all these sort of things in mind to do, um, but not everyone does. And so, I mean, just personally, like, exactly what you're talking about is my own goal. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think that is very important. You have to show people that this is possible and give them the sort of the plans and show them what hardships they're going to sort of face. Um, you know, what do you have, to, what, what can you not have learned without just doing it the hard way, right? And then show people how to prevent, you know, that from happening. Or what do you need to sort of keep in mind to hedge against of things that will come up no matter what. But here's how you can plan for it, at least, as opposed to it coming up and surprising you, right? Well, I'm seeing also there's a, a, another fa a facet of OSC would be a support organization that would help people who start fledgling businesses and get in there and help them work yeah. out the iron out problems and, and help with the uh, details and, and give them suggestions on how they can enhance their business. Yeah, I mean, that's a mentoring service. Yeah. That well, I mean, that's, that's too, what we're right? talking is education. Yeah. Right. I saw there are, there are mentors, some mentors listed on the, the, into the Facebook. The list mentors, you know, right? Yeah, that kind of idea mm -hmm. set up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you probably have technical oh, yeah, mentors. Yeah. You probably have business mentors. You probably have, you know, mm -hmm. sort of community building mentors, mm -hmm. right? Because those are all very different elements of what it would mean to really push, you know, my own sort of entrepreneurial effort in that yeah. regard mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. So basically what we're talking about is lighting a fire under people to get them productive and, and, and to start doing things independently and then give them support to help them continue it. Right? Mm -hmm. that, that's where your fire is going to start right there. Mm -hmm. What can you do to kindle that? Little bit? <laughs> he just did. That was his <laughs> fart. You, did, uh, <laughs> you can kindle that a little more by running camps learning through on camps and then you know, as you keep getting involved then you become part of that creation process yeah yeah we're all doing it here like what you what y'all be talking about is yeah that's all happening and we're trying to mm -hmm. do that and about capacity like what's the next major step we can do I mean uh, steam camps are we're starting to get like a pretty much a captive market with them like with the San Diego people like some we're lining up some stuff for the summer and they're they're bringing the 12 people to that event guaranteed and we're opening it up to others and stuff like that so like that yeah like uh, for one but teaching yeah. people how to nurture that kind of relationship is a product right like yeah. how did you come to that opportunity that is something that you can document and yeah. create as a product yeah. that is more of a community building product or a relationship you know building product mm -hmm. than anything that's going to be technical you know, that is something worth documenting in and of itself. Even if it sort of happened accidentally, th there's some sort of sequence of events there that now if you think about it in a more purposeful way, you can orchestrate and replicate. Yeah. Right? How would you right. go about replicating that based on what you've learned already? Yeah. You know, yeah. go prove that that works based on that model and then teach that. Yeah. That's more valuable than any of the technical components. We, we have all the information in the world implementing that technical information is really the crux of what we're trying to get over there's the issue there that uh, like a lot of times in this project is that you need a product like that product is based on another product and that is some production so that has to come up in parallel as well mm -hmm. we've got some of that well it's uh, like a yeah. like a 3d printer able to print a linear bearing and then you can take that and you yeah. can you can simplify the design and, and create not just an independent linear bearing, but just make it a, 
and lunar bearings part of the uh, bigger assembly that you can print in one pass. Yeah. Those, those are things that I think is very valuable to industry as well. You know, people in industry would be all over that. Yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. And, that's and, and so, you know, uh, what we need to be thinking about is how we can kickstart people to, to do that and, and help them, support them, and get them out. And, and that would be the OSC business. You know, that would be a big part of what the yeah. OSC could do. Yeah. yeah I mean, I because that. as you've articulated, the products are simply a means to an end. Right? If you really think about your mission statement and human-oriented goals, the products are just a means to an end. So if you're really thinking about how do we solve the end end goal games, the end game, um, there's a lot of other things that go into that than just these technical, you know, components and products. Yeah. Yeah. We do have an explicit in the summer. We have an enterprise track. So yeah. So three hours every night, we're going to be just nailing these issues. Like, okay, what are all the other elements besides the technical? So we just but it would be really great like this and actually generating documents and stuff like that and assets. Mm -hmm. It'd be really great to have case studies of how has this happened in the past to you know base those conversations around. Uh, we can talk about you know the potential. The theory of the potential of you know a hydrogen economy till we're blue in the face but if you can't draw from someone who has actually done this even in some fractional way uh, eventually you're going to sort of lose interest and traction because you don't have hard numbers or mistakes that have been made that now you can plan for and you know mitigate against um you know precious plastics is probably the best um the best evolved case study that exists from my just you know research understanding right now that we have an intimate sort of knowledge of and at bat at um, of simply capturing processing and producing you know plastic waste that provides some business model if the goal is distributing business models that is the most clearly defined one that I've seen and, and most of the success stories that, that currently exist in, in op open source, mm -hmm. it, it's m more about software. And, and uh, what we're talking about is right. expanding that, and we need to take the hardware approach. But we, there's no, no reason we couldn't use the software uh, success stories as case stories, you know, case studies, and say, look, well, they took Linux, and they have they many yeah. commercial companies, and they, they keep it uh, pure sure. Linux. They contribute back open source to the community. And, and th but they're able to make a good living out of it. Yeah. And, and that's a good case study to look. And then we need to apply that to hardware and take it to the next level. Mm hmm Yeah. 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 That's what I was going to say. So, uh, sort of back to what we were getting into about just sort of what are we doing today or tomorrow, you know, like once we get into uh, the... Um, you know, open source tablet and video production rig, you know, that can be a sort of product that can have a whole business model revolve around it. That for someone who's super interested in video, like the guy in Chris's team, I think, like if he has a printer and wants to print all this stuff and assemble it, I'm sure he's, you know, somewhat in tune with the video world. He probably knows people that would be interested in buying super low cost, you know, video production rigs that are perfectly fine for what their sort of nearer term goals are. Uh, they don't need the most highest end of equipment. Um, if it allows them to go and do whatever they're trying to do in a much lower, you know, overhead scale. So he can sell these packages to people he knows in that industry, right? It's the same concept that I know in the construction world, like, if I have a, you know, skid steer with a big old bucket on the front with some nice, great teeth, I can go wreck, you know, a house in rural <laughs> Missouri and... For a living. Yeah. And I have no overhead, and I can charge them, you know, 60% of market value <laughs> and still <laughs> make a killing. Yeah. Right? That's the idea. 
So the product. Another thing about the product, the, the movie one, the idea you had was that we were using that for these camps then too. It's part of mm -hmm. the structure that right. we are, you know, we need to have this set up in order to communicate, which makes, you know, that makes sense too. If you're actually through the system supplying the right. stuff you need to run the stuff, that exactly. makes sense. That, I was wondering about why the video too, a little, I was like, why video? But now, now it makes sense. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> it was documenting and everything, yeah. yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> so. And so, yeah. Um, so anyway, those are some very clear opportunities I see that, I mean, you could spend a month or two just talking about what is the next level of sort of process and planning that's going to get you to scale, sort of, you, you reach a new sort of scale threshold, I think, in these, you know, trainings. <coughs> and so what does it take for you to continue going in this sort of next scale phase where you're starting to get you know, people in tens or hundreds at a time um, because they're going to be hungry and you want to keep them as something of a repeat customer, right? You know, you don't want to have to pay to acquire every customer or, you know, participant that you get. Once you get one, you want to keep them and continue to provide and derive value from them. Um, so if you can give them one business model that works, they'll likely be interested in additional business models, you know, that work, right? Because How do we move forward on the catalog? That would be a ta one tactical thing. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think the... Products that have a, a wide utility, that you're going to have a big audience base, that are not so specialized that you know your your window of potential customers is super small. So like linear bearings is wildly um, valuable to a very narrow you know subset of people, but the video production equipment has a much wider audience base. So I would be trying to sort of push that you know far more, especially in this world of everyone has a you know production quality camera on their phone. You know, if we can create a phone mount, you know, even beyond mm -hmm. the, the sort of, you know, 4K touchscreen tablet as an option, now you have a whole video production rig that you can print from waste plastic that costs a couple hundred dollars, and you can go and use whatever video skills you have, right? So I have a bunch of friends in the video world. I would love to be able to just print them out their whole own, like, video studio. And they could be, they could freelance, they could take on, you know, employees, because their overhead you know, stay so low. Well, also, I mean, something real simple, like cordless drill. I mean, if you can enable somebody to start making those and selling... Absolutely. And, yeah, I mean, that, that's a business. But that takes a, that, that's going to take some engineering to get to the point where that is a refined product right. that you are able to produce. Right. So I mean, like, today, <laughs> like well, one of the things that well, are the lowest well, hanging fruit. Well, but, but, but that's, that's the deal. Part of it is... is to get in with somebody and, and to, to help them to, to get started with it, and they can start developing that themselves as their project, contribute it back to open source, but with the intent of selling them commercially. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I could see that. Yeah, but, okay, but those, for that to work, my experience is you got to create a mass process around it. Like, it's going to take that guy forever to do it, and then he's going to close it up because he's going to say, oh, I spent I two years developing this. it, and right. fuck you, I'm from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, then that, our answer to that is, our answer to that is um, the incentive challenge. 2,000 people, six months, we transform an industry. Yay. And so those are the larger strategic <laughs> sort of efforts that September. you're implementing yeah, that have tactical elements, yeah. but as far as... Um, more immediate, lower barrier to entry products as far as just building a catalog, um, I think there are a lot of there are. components in that world. Yeah. I think there's opportunity for um, you know, battery chargers, solar charge controllers, I mean things that are not that complicated that if you can sort of refine a process yeah. and build you know, cheaply that you're competing with China, right? But you build it yourself, you're creating jobs the quality is at least as good if not better and it's about lifetime design right um you know i mean hell 
smoke detectors, light switch covers, uh, yeah. speaker enclosures, yeah. uh, coat hooks, you know, hinges, um, knobs. I mean, just all kinds of random stuff. That a lot of that's already out there on the internet. Um, but if you can have a centralized place where there's a little bit more of a refined or better version of it that stays still stays on an open source you know license um but is all in one place to where me as a someone who's sort of entrepreneurial that wants to come out and figure out okay there's a lot of sort of household oriented things here i can go to a builder and say look let me print you your next house's worth of light switch plates uh door hinges you know x y and z and I'll give it to you for, you know, 500 bucks. And normally it would cost them, whatever, like 1300 to source all of that because all the different houses that they have to get, I say houses, all the different supply shops they have to go to to source all those different things have their own markup and margin. And, you know, they're just sort of leaking um, margin everywhere. Um, so that's how I sort of mind to think about it is what are some... Uh, categorically similar things that we can build a, uh, you know, a catalog around and who has relationships to go and print a bunch of these things and then go market it, you know, to individuals. You know, there's rehabbers who want to cut costs at every opportunity they get, but still have a, you know, a good um, product that they sell, you know, someone's going to buy this house. So where are opportunities there that go into just remodeling a house that I have old light switch covers that are, you know, bent or painted or whatever, and I'm going to have to replace them, but I want, you know, nice white ones, or I want them a different style or shape or, you know, whatever it ends up being, um, you know, you can print them out, uh, on a printer and then <clears> drill <throat> out on the CNC mill, the whatever odd things that you couldn't do, or, you know, I mean, technically you could just print like this and have all the holes there but I think there would be a lot of room for something that would involve art and, and light for sure because you could do something really creative with any dress up my house right? clearly I'm not artistic enough to even think of that but that's absolutely an element I mean if you can you know offer sort of somewhat not pre-canned but like conceptually canned um, custom light switch covers Oh, I've got you, and and there's some, and I've seen these. Mass, I often. opportunity for mass customization in general exactly. uh, is where we are at a different kind of uh, economic model. If you talk about housing or anything like yeah. that, because it's and it potentially doesn't even. I mean, and my question somewhat is like, can we cut out, cut out the builder who marks out that rebate and whatever Absolutely. exponential percent and just yeah. go more directly to mm. yeah. folks who like are kind of cut out of everything at this point? Right. But, uh, I mean, how many times have you seen uh, uh, where you get a, a gang of switches over there, a, a box, yep. and they'll put a, a switch here, a switch here, and then a different type of rotator knob and something yep. else over there, and they don't make a single plate cover exactly. to, to do that, Yeah. but you can print one. Yeah, exactly. Or same with thing with your, uh, like, um, audio, like, um, so a lot of, like, electronics and audio specialists that go into houses they'll basically just cut a hole in the wall with like an ambiguous output um, of a pipe and they'll just feed all their wires through there. But it could look a lot cleaner. There just isn't a standardized, you know, faceplate for all those different interfaces based on whatever that audio design needs. Mm -hmm. So that can be a whole collection, a category of, you know, uh, catalog items is, well, I can print you a module for banana plugs, I can print you a module for an HDMI uh, port, I can print you a module for whatever, and then I can print you a custom faceplate that corresponds to having all those in the wall instead of just having an outlet, you know, like a hole in the wall for all those wires to be fed through. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, I mean, the, 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 the ideas go wild about what you could do. I mean, in, in, in that, But uh, you have to kind of have some of those relationships to explain and sort of market that to the end buyer of those products mm -hmm. to explain how much do you <clears throat> hate how it looks when you leave a job and there's basically just a hole in the wall behind a TV or receiver and you've got all these wires coming out or whatever. Or, well, let me just print you the products that will do this same thing right. in the way people expect it to be <clears throat> done and not just have this gross hole in the wall 
I'll print you, you know, the faceplate, the actual electrical components that come out of there, right? Well, let's say also something simple, like you have like an industrial controls where you have a big panel mm -hmm. and you have a lot of custom components in there, right? And you have these labels that, that are stick on or tape on or something that keep getting knocked off, and then you don't know what that is. Right. You could print a panel with all that in there in, in a single piece, and the labels would just be etched right in into the thing, saying yeah. this is what it is. Right. Yeah. So there's lots of opportunity there. Um, it takes. I think those are becoming, you know, larger barriers to entry as far as, you know, just amassing a catalog of products. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, you know, hell, in not too long, we can contend with Ikea. Um, yeah. I mean, really? <laughs> and, and that's a whole yeah. business model yeah. is just taking Ikea products and essentially coming up with an open source, you know, yeah. version of them and just print it out from scratch and yeah. it may cost Ooh, I can't wait so the 3d printed furniture I, I think about that that's that to me is actually a low-hanging fruit with the large printers yeah exactly yeah I mean you could print an ends table upside down in one print all one piece yeah. you know no screw on you know whatever components it's just you print a table here's a table you can even print right? doors in place too yeah <laughs> exactly Wait till you were uh, out the door. Do like this summer. Like this right here? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, um, I mean, I think that's what it takes to amass a catalog because then, you know, I can just be a print shop in, you know, a sort of low income area and I can go to all the different, you know, sort of church communities or, um, all these different places that have people that need stuff and if I'm good enough at you know free cat or design I can just tell them hey keep a list of things that people need and you know send me a list once a week and I'll come back to you and say oh I can I can actually make that and print that for you and just give it to you for you know, whatever. I think Martin's got the right idea, though. We need to pick the low-hanging fruit. We need to go after something that's going to be easy and right. something that people are really going to want. Yeah. And and yeah, and then then charge on. Just target that and go. Right. Um, so those are kind of my thoughts about product catalog. Is you know, wide audience value. I, mean, I, I don't think building your own relationships. Furniture. I don't think you heard it the other day, but we were talking when we were driving into town is that, that there's uh, I got some friends that go to gun shows and one oh, of the yeah. things one of the things they, they have that they need it is, is sometimes people will have a gun but the, the plastic handle grips, you know, they get banged up and missing and screws gone and whatever. And so if you could like have a database of those mm. you know, for each gun, gun grip you could design have custom gun grips. They, or you could even customize it for a person's hand, you know, for their hand geometry, you know, mm -hmm. just for them. It's, and those things go for a pretty high markup. You know, yeah. those, just stock ones are like, I don't know, 30 to 50 bucks for, for a set of little hand grips, this, this big, you know. The Armageddon market could be huge. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Hey, the peppers. Know, I mean, Texas, you know, don't mess with Texas. Right? <laughs> There's a lot of Texans that have guns, and in, in West Virginia also. <laughs> are they all hot and no cattle? <laughs> <laughs> or are they for real? <laughs> no, I, I, I'll introduce you to some real ones if you want. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so, awesome. Okay, but let's let's yeah. continue on this. Good stuff. Um, so what next? Should we just finish up the lesson? We started. Can we maybe like go through it? Like yeah, bam, and we gotta finish it. Do we want to take a break or? No, let, I mean let's finish it. Let's and, finish and it. Let's, it. It won't take a okay. little, little, little while. All right. Finish well, it up. <coughs> right back on track <laughs> with a minor interruption. Okay, so we're taking the Arduino, and we have a, um, th this here. We've said we have a potentiometer, and this is going to give us on a zero. We're going to have an adjustable. Uh, reference there that will go from 0 to 5 volts continuously and then this will provide us we'll, we'll read that on A0 and use that input to to control the width of the pulses that are going out over here on pin 6 where it says PWM out. Um, 
I do believe there's some software involved there. There certainly is. And uh, funny you would say such a thing because here's the software. It's on the next page. And and this um, <coughs> so uh, this loads the code into the Arduino. And note that it does not change frequency. And so th this is the simple code. It uses a default frequency, which is around 490 hertz. And even so, that's a lot higher than regular uh, wall AC electricity, which runs at 60 hertz. But uh, so what this does, you can see it sets an LED pin. Question, quick question. Yes. What is human visible for light oscillation? Human, so, you, you can... Like you can see the flicker. Generally, uh, if you get, say like movies in a theater, if you go below uh, about 15 frames per second, okay, then, then you can start noticing. Okay, so this is will be like very smooth. Yeah, lighting. this being 490, you won't even see it. Yeah. And, and this, this will be when we, when we pulse our LED, you won't see the LED blinking on and off. You, all you'll see is the LED on and, and but, but the uh, intensity of it, the, the average lumen output of it, we will be able to notice that will go up and down. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. so, so anyway, this is the code. It's pretty straightforward. We're saying that we have an LED pin, a pot pin is our A0, that's our input. It would have uh, these, these variables here. We have a setup. We say pin mode, in, LED in for pin. integer. Yep, that, that's uh, integer. And Definitions, then the, yep. The LED pin is going to uh, map that to our output. That, that'll drive an LED. Um, and this is a simple loop. You have where did tell me where this ever this void come up with? Is there a history to why it's that's called the, void? It's the output of the function. So there is no output of this function, and so it just has to say that it is casted as there's no output. Oh. Other okay, times okay, you would right. say that the output could be an int, or it could be a string, or it could be whatever. Mm -hmm. So in, in languages, they have typing for things, and, and you have a function that is a, a type, and you want to make sure that every everything is documented. So every function is going to have a kind of a type and this is just a way of saying well the type of output this is going to give is a nothing because we're not expecting anything so but but in software terms it helps what are other in arduino environment what are other things besides void you could give an integer you could give a float you, you could um, it, it, it's what what type it returns when it exits okay that, that's what it does okay i see so, so this is a real simple deal here, and the first one, all it's going to do is drive an LED, and then um, I'll, we'll use an oscilloscope and connect it to the output in between the ground pin of the oscilloscope will go to ground, and then the output will go to pin 6 on the Arduino, and then you'll see something like this. And then as you adjust the potentiometer, you'll be able to see that the output the width of the pulses coming coming out will go all the way down to zero, and then you'll see it go all the way up until you get a total DC output. So, in, in other words, at 100% duty cycle, all you get is a solid 5 volt DC output. Mm -hmm. Tell me what map does. So, analog read read is like you're reading the pin. Map means what? Just you you map that value onto that. What's the map function? Um, yeah, the, the the mapping map reference voltage on one. Uh -huh, so this is specific for like LEDs or various functions. I haven't seen maps. Uh, this is this is Arduino code. Okay. Yeah, um, is, this, is, the is, is this is this the source code of Arduino and I, 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 that map I, it, this appears what it's yes. doing that it's setting the output to the LED value and we're, we're defining a scale uh, that it'll that mm -hmm. it'll it'll go yeah I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that Ardu Arduino code that is this a reference system. sketch from examples with an Arduino environment yes okay so you can pick this sketch off you don't have to write it yourself it's a sample sketch or program with an Arduino environment. So you have that. Anyone has that to play with? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we talked about this already. We're going to have an oscilloscope. We're going to watch the output of it. Um, and and you'll, you'll see that as the 
uh, you adjust the potentiometer, you'll see the width of those pulses go up and down. Mm -hmm. um, and then the case one, this is a light dimmer. This is basically going to use an, an LED. This, this is my output, but uh, we, we already have one of these in our example with our DIY Arduino that's already blinking an LED for us, so this is already the case. And this is what it uses. It uses a 1K resistor. Um, now the LED itself over here, when you forward bias it, and that means you put uh, plus, five, uh, plus voltage on one side and, and the other side to ground, say like we have here, uh, and then at normal output, when, when the LED is turned on, it needs to have a current going through the LED of somewhere between around 1 to 20 milliamps. And that's a typical one of these little, small, super bright dome LEDs. Uh, the resistor above it is selected in value 1K, and and this would be to limit the current going through the LED. So the way we would fig calculate how much uh, current that's going to pass through the LED, we can take uh, 5 volts, which we said is the output of the Arduino. And so, uh, now we said also that the LED, when you forward bias it, it, it consumes 1.2 volts. And, and that's just a fact of the silicon junctions in there. Is it that when you have an LED and it's turned on, it'll be about 1.2 to 1.3 volts across the LED. So what that'll do is the resistor takes up the rest of the voltage and, and the value of it is adjusted so that you can uh, control how much current is going to go through the LED. So let's start, we have 5 volts, and we subtract from that 1.2 volts. That gives us 3.8 volts. And you divide that, you remember the formula from above, we said voltage equals current times resistance. And so the, the converse of that, we can say that the current is going to be the voltage divided by the resistance. And the voltage across the resistor is going to be 3.8 volts. So we're going to divide that by the resistance, which is 1,000. And that gives us 3.8 milliamps. And so that's going to be the current going through the LED to make it illuminate. Mm -hmm. so the, as I said, these are very simple formulas, but they're also very useful. Um, <clears throat> so this one is the example that we already have going <clears throat> with the Arduino. And so the following example, now I'm showing this one here. This is a bit more complex. We're not going to... Can, can we go back to one? If you put yes, two sir. resistors in parallel, would they reduce the effective resistance? Yes. yes. So you could uh, get this twice as bright. Say, say like if you take a 1K resistor and put it in parallel with another 1K resistor, it basically gives you half that. Because right? you got, I think so. Because half, you've half got resistance. Yeah. You've got two paths, so it's du twice double the current. Yeah, du it'll, it'll double the current, which will basically give you half the resistance. Yeah, I love and that. And then, then if you take two resistors and put them in series, of course, that'll double the resistance. Yeah. So if you wanted this light to be a little more than five milliamps or the four milliamps, which we have, it's rated for up to twenty milliamps. Right. So here it'll be quarter its max intensity. Right, so you could, uh, and you could calculate that also if, if you'd like to see how much you could get, um, how much resistance would take to get a 20 milliamps through the LED. Well, what, what's our formula here? We said it's going to be 3.8 volts and we want 20 milliamps. So we'll take 3.8 divided by 0 0.020. So that's 20 milliamps. And that would be 190 ohms. That's what we'd have to have to drive it at, at and, and usually those LEDs, that's their, their spec. That's what they're rated at for max current. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do this. All right. So now we're going to control. Wow, this and, is getting pretty advanced. Yeah, so this one, huh. uh, now we're talking, let's see. This, I like this, it. This was our light dimmer. This is, this is a light dimmer circuit. And I just wanted to show this as an example, because this is going to be um, using an external power supply. And, and the reason we need this is, 
well, multi reasons, but but partially because this this uh, IGBT we're going to drive here, it requires more than five volts on the input to the gate in order to make it switch. So, How much does so it require? It depends on the specs of it. Some some of them are around seven up to fifteen volts on the gate. It, it needs a square wave like that. So so it needs more than five volts. So Arduino can't drive it directly. And so what this does, you see, we have the same potentiometer, and then we have the same uh, output for our PWM output, but we put that into one transistor, and then it goes into the gate of the IGBT, and and this is what ends up controlling the IGBT. We, we have to go into one transistor, first of all, because this one is tied to the higher voltage, and I put over here, it's got to be more than, greater than equal to 15 volts. And so what this will do, this will drive the gate of the IGBT with the higher voltage. What, are, what will that voltage be? It'll, it'll, it'll be up to 15, uh, up to 15 volts. Let's, let's, let's say this battery is a 15 volt battery. Then, then it'll, it'll drive this less with up to 15 volts. Greater than or equal. Oh, no. It should be less than. Is that yeah, what you just I said? No, no. Greater, greater than. Uh, oh, it's going to be at least 15 volts. Right. Yeah, yeah, I need at least 15, right? Mm -hmm. um, Wait, but you have a resistor there, so this, this right. one. Well, this, this is basically, you might call it a pull-up resistor. And, and uh, th this, this resistor, all it does is when this transistor, when the first transistor uh, shuts off, this pulls up this gate voltage of the IGBT to whatever the battery voltage is, 15. Right, but when you're oh, you're saying saying the gate just like draws no current, so it's really yeah, got it, 15 volts. The, the gate draws like 400 nanoamperes. Okay, I mean, so it's, it's like effectively zero. So you're driving the gate at 15 amps, and then you're pulling that up. If you didn't have that, what would happen? You wouldn't. Well, if you didn't have this, then then the the collector voltage on the transistor would flounder. It wouldn't. It would never go high enough to to switch off or uh, switch on the IGBT. Mm hmm. And so, uh, yeah, so, so this basically, it, and, and that, that gate current is almost zero, so it, all it really needs is a voltage, a reference voltage, to tell okay. it whether to switch on or off. And it's still got that 1K. Yep, so we have an LED so going here. Uh, for well, the LED. Mm -hmm. Right, and so this is our, our LED light, and, and but we're basically driving this from an external battery. Uh, okay, so <coughs> let's, let's eliminate the 10K. Uh, why do you say you wouldn't have gate voltage there? Because you do have 15 volts if you didn't have that resistor there at the gate. Uh, you you can't eliminate the 10k resistor. If you just tied that directly to the battery, then it would it would fry oh. fry this transistor. Because that transistor cannot. Because when you turn this transistor on, you tell it switch on and take everything here and dump it into ground, and it would just smoke. Oh, okay, okay. So you're limiting its yeah. current, right. right? And and how and much do you have to limit it to? Why did you choose 10k? Um, 10k is just a reference. I chose it because it's a nice even number, and and uh, you know it, it's a it's a value that is very low in current. But but all we really need is is to get good switching in this transistor, and we need to to give a good reference voltage out. 10k is a trivial amount of value, but but now you'll notice when we switch to the other uh, the other circuit and we start switching from the wall, then the net value is going to go up because we have to have. Okay, uh, so let's look at this. So it's on, and you've got the gate turned on, right? If it's off, what happens there? There's <coughs> well, when it's off, there's basically no current flows through the 10k resistor. But when it's on, we have whatever voltage here goes through the 10K and through the transistor. So on, basically the transistor acts like a short circuit. And so that means it puts all of the 15 volts across the 10K resistor. So if we have, what do we say, 15 volts, right? You divide that by 10,000, then that gives us 1.5 milliamps. Mm -hmm. And so that 10K resistor will get 1.5 milliamps flowing through it and and uh, that that basically brings this gate 
down very yeah. close to zero. The thing that I'm not getting here, so if that's 15 volts there and it's connected to the gate, wouldn't that mean the gate's on all the time? It's no. connected through no. the resistor. No. No, no, it, 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 because this transistor, what, what this does, it, 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 when you turn it on from the Arduino and the Arduino pulse goes high, then that goes into this transistor that, sa that says turn it on and it basically short circuits the collector to the emitter and it drags this voltage right here down to zero. Oh, so it's actually opposite. Yeah. We're, we're, and, and what this is, it's oh. going to invert our signal. It's an inverter? Yeah. <laughs> okay. What, the IGBT is the huh. is the battery pack. I What's see, the so IGBT? It I, I, IGBT is just another transistor, but it's a high power transistor. High power transistor. Right. Okay. See, so we had to have uh, two stages in here, because the the first stage is low power, and it has to accept the input from the Arduino, and this is a, mm -hmm. only a max of five volts to the Arduino. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From the Arduino, and and we need a higher voltage than that to trigger the IGBT. Okay. So that's why we had to put in a second transistor. Volts. But this one, this one is just a, you'll see it, it's just a little bitty transistor. It, it doesn't handle much power or anything. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is it. Okay. And so the IGBT, it, this is our load when we see a LED in a 1K resistor. That's our load for right now. And, and uh, so this would be the same or should I say a, a similar uh, mm -hmm. LED slash light dimmer application yeah. right here. So, so to summarize, whenever this transistor is on, this is off. Yes. When it's off, it's on. Right. Okay. All right. So that's why. It's so that means you have to program it like in reverse. Like when you want that a lot of power, you, sh you do a short Dewey cycle. All you do is you reverse the, the labeling on your potentiometer. Instead of max, min, you just swap them. Okay. All right. Oh. Well, trickery. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I like it. Okay. And so I'm now we'll in love with we it. believe you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now we're going to take this to the next level. And so on the next one, this is uh, this 7.3, we're going to use wall power to power an incandescent light bulb. Yeah. And so this has the same setup here. We have the same potentiometer. This time we have a, uh, the same 1K going to a little transistor here. Mm -hmm. But now notice this is a 200K uh, resistor. And not only has this got to be 200K, but it also has to be able to handle mm -hmm. up to 240 volts. Mm -hmm. But now you take 240 volts, and, and what, what that is, that's a sine wave. And so you, you have like a, a sine wave going like this. And when you say 240 volts, it's somewhere around 0.7 something. That's, and this is the the RMS, the the root mean square average, of of what this whole thing is doing. And so, uh, but but what we have to to scale for is the peak. So this peak over here can be up to 330 volts if if you're taking 240 uh, off the wall. And so the the insula the capability of that resistor, it has to be able to handle up to 330 volts. Or else it, you can get some shorting and then bad things like smoke. It's a 200K resistor. So yeah. Up to 200, 340. And so for our our uh, workshop, uh, I selected, I think, a half, uh, half watt uh, 200K resistor. resistor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to go back to uh, to our our, our formulas, right? So, um, in our formula about power, so what do we say power is? Current times voltage. Yeah, current, current times voltage. But let's see, what do we know? We know the resistance and we know the, the voltage. And I said the voltage, the peak voltage is going to be 330 volts. And we're going to divide that by our resistance, which is 200K. 200,000. So that gives us 1.6 milliamps, 1.65, and that's what's going to be going through here. Now, now if we take that, the, our other formula, and we say voltage equals current times the resistance, that'll that'll tell us. Um, let's see, what are we looking for now? <laughs> we we know the mm -hmm. voltage drop. We know the voltage, 
uh, the current going through it and the power. Well, wait, wait, what did you draw these diagrams with? Dia? I, I drew these, di yeah, with Dia. It's an open source uh, drawing program. And in Dia, there's one of the sheets you can select, and it has these components in it. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's good. Now, now there's an opportunity for someone in the open source world, if they want to contribute to Dia, they can contribute sheets. Like, for example, this potentiometer symbol right there, I, I, they, they didn't have a, a off-the-shelf potentiometer symbol in there. So I took a resistor and put it in there, and I added a little arrow. But those, you know, normally a potentiometer is going to have both those components, a, a, a resistor and an arrow. So that would be good if somebody wants to dive in and create some DIA sheets. And and we could have some for OSE. There, there's some of these for hydraulics. There's some of these for computers and networking. And, you know, Cisco's contributed to it. Mm -hmm. Other companies, too. Um, they have one for hydraulics? How do you, yeah. what's it, how do you spell Not that good. program? D-I-A. D-I-A. It's like diagram, but just mm -hmm. for short. We're in the National Airport. It, it's good. I mean, it, it's one of those uh, open source things that you have to, you know, learn how to use it. But, but it, it's a very useful editor. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So, uh, anyway, back to this, this uh, light dimmer. Hmm. What we have on the other side here is a bridge rectifier. So we take the incoming power off the wall and we convert it from AC to DC. Now what this does is it takes the, the incoming AC and it basically takes this part of the wave and then inverts it and it makes it go positive like that. <clears throat> and so, so you, you end up with all positive uh, waves coming out. And so this makes it to where they call this a full wave rectified AC. And so that's that's what we're getting across here uh, to our circuit. And then so we're going to take our, our same transistor here and we're going to drive the IGBT with it. Uh, I did put this 17 volt zener in there. And what that zener does is that limits the amount of, of voltage that can go to that gate. It limits it to 17 volts. Because these IGBTs, if you put more than 20 volts on the gate, you get a smoke test. Mm. You know, uh, and that's yeah, not not preferable. <laughs> mm hmm What's the rectifier look like? This you've seen, you might have seen one of these. Mm. Right. That's what a rectifier right. looks like. We've got uh, this one, and this is they call it a bridge rectifier. It's actually it's got four diodes in it, like in this circuit right here. And, and so usually they'll be marked. You see they, they put a plus sign on, on one lead like that. Mm -hmm. And that, that lets you know this is plus and probably the corresponding one over there is going to be negative and these two are where the AC goes. So you put AC here and, and this will be your output DC coming out. Mm -hmm. Just like they have here. You got AC on, on these sides and then you got DC coming out. Goes oh yeah, so the typically it's actually geometrically like that, that's for sure. Yeah, because they the, <laughs> they they put four diodes in there and yeah. they wire them like that. Yeah. <coughs> um, yeah, and so I replaced the LED and the resistor with this light bulb, and so um, this thing. I mean, you could drive this up if this thing is able to handle, you know, say regular wall current at 15 amps. You could drive it. That would be no problem. You could put a 15 amp load on there. And let's go back to our power formula. Uh, let's say you had uh, 15 amps, and and you drove that at 240 volts. 240 times 15. So that's 3,600 watts we can control with this simple circuit. With the little Arduino. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, what did I do? Oh, oh, I'm bouncing around from one tab to the other. You got a mouse on this thing? Oh, good, good. It's this one. It's our instruction. Okay. All right. So moving right along. Yeah. Um, so you're clipping the 17 volts. Right. Basically, yeah. like all all that does that limits how much voltage can go into the gate of the IGBT. And what's the limit? Uh, oh, like the specs on this one are about 20 volts. Okay. So we can't. If you put 20 volts onto it, then. And what's the minimum? Like you said. 
Seven? Uh, this one, I, I think it's um, seven to 12, or something like that. Okay, yeah. so we're in a good range. Okay. Okay, and uh, so then, then following that, uh, the next application wow. is a battery charger. And so what we're talking about doing is a uh, two-stage charging battery charger for the using an Arduino. Are we going to build that? Uh, not in this class. No, not this this no, one. No, maybe, maybe, let, let's, let's target March for it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but what this is going to do is this will take from the wall. It'll take 200 volts, 240 volts coming in, and we'll smooth that out. And then drive a uh, IGBT here with it. The IGBT is going to be it's going to get its PWM signal from the Arduino, and it's going to be driven through a transistor in this optocoupler here. And this optocoupler, and this is our same setup with our 17 volt Zener, and this is our IGBT. So we'll take this, and this is our transistor like in the other one. But this one, uh, the optocoupler, it, it's really cool. What it does, it has a little LED in it, and then it has a transistor that is optically sensitive. And so whenever the LED shines a light, then the transistor gets that light, and it tells it to turn on. And so, but you have, it, it, it's, it's, it's something ridiculous, like the 1,000-volt isolation between this side and that side. And there's, there's the only contact between them is, is through photons. Why wouldn't you just? Why have the photon layer? Well, the reason why. why Communicate. Simple question. Yeah. Why? The, the 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 real reason why is because uh, we we want to isolate as much as possible this side of the circuit from this side, and and you know in in, in elect you know electricity right when you go to ground stuff you, yeah. you if you have stuff tied to a ground then you can get shocked. You know, yeah. if you grab the wrong wire. Okay. But but this one, if you don't have so anything tied to ground, insulation essentially. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a safety thing. Yeah. You know, so so that if anybody touches anything inside here, they, they have no way. It has no way to ground out, so they, they won't get shot. Cool. Um, That's yeah. That's unnecessary stuff. But I mean, these are opto isolators. We we already I, I bought one for this this thing as a test and. You know, it's just a little bitty thing, and they're cheap. They're no, you're not protecting bucks. any of that. You're protecting the Arduino from getting fried by it's that voltage yeah, there. It's, no? it's doing that too. It's uh, but the transformer is what gives you isolation uh, also. Yeah. Um, and the, the transformer isolates the power the over here, and this there. this tra uh, isolates the signal. So <coughs> I got these little capacitors there. Yeah, four nanofarads. I ran through some calculator, figured that out. I'm hoping that's the right value. <laughs> but what's it for? <laughs> uh, these capacitors, we have two four nanofarad capacitors going to the A0 and the A1 input. And what those do is those uh, smooth out the signal going into those inputs because this is normally a chopped, um, you know, square wave is coming into it, or pulses, or PWM. It'll, it'll, this going across here, it'll be show those big uh, uh, square waves. Uh -huh. But what these do, this 100k resistor and a capacitor, that that smooths it out so that it can get a reference to these two pins, A0 and A1, as far as what the DC value of this is, and this is the average DC value. Because we need uh, smooth uh, averages to know how to control the Arduino. Because we, we don't want to be constantly having it bounce up and down. Like one time it might sample it at the top of the peak, and one might, next time it might sample at the valley. And we don't want it adjusting up and down too quickly. We want it to be smoother. Mm -hmm. So that's why these two little capacitors there and the 100K resistors. <coughs> but what this does is that the IGBT drives the power into this transformer and out the other side of the transformer we go through a second bridge rectifier so that translates it back into DC again and then what what these two inputs into the A0 and A1 are on the Arduino is wait how come we already have a rectifier there yeah right so we got two so that's DC there right. but you're chopping it 
Right. So you take AC to DC here, right. but here you're chopping that so it effectively becomes like a pulse. So it's okay. oscillating. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So you need you can transform it there. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so then you got to rectify it again. And so this this then the output of this this goes across our battery, and this this actually provides charging power to the battery. Now I've got this 0.1 ohm resistor here, and it's a half watt. And this is there, we call it a shunt, and it's for sensing current, how much current is going through the battery. And so that's what this A0 input is. That's, that's the battery current. And then the A1 is going to be the battery voltage. And this is going to be important because uh, in, in our two-stage uh, charging, we have to know both the current and the voltage going into that, that battery so that we can uh, control it. Because the first stage of a two-stage charger, we have to have a constant current charging. And then the constant current has to have to keep the constant current up until it reaches a voltage of around 4.2 volts. That, that varies depending on battery chemistry, 4.1 to mm -hmm. 4.3, but let's say 4.2 average. And then once it reaches that, that voltage, then we switch from giving a constant current charging to constant voltage charging. So, so you hold the voltage at, at that 4.2 volts, and then you watch the current through the A0, and when the current drops below a level, then you can determine that through formulas, but, but when it, the current drops below a level, then you can say, okay, charging is complete, I'm going to stop charging. Is this for one battery or a whole string? It can be for a string. I'm showing is in, it the same here a string, like in parallel, for yeah. example. Yeah, you don't get uh, load leveling. You don't get leveling of cells from one to the next. That's the fancy that your chargers do that. Is that a, how important is it? Are you going to bloat it up? You have to make sure that all the cells are either new or of the same sort of quality and voltage, right? If you have right. some that are already sort of de degraded and are at different capacities, mm -hmm. then you could blow one to try to overcharge it based on what another one can handle. Well, you, you always right. want to make sure you have the same kind of cells, because some 18650s have more capacity than others, right. some they have different chemistries and uh, different voltages, and so if, if you have... It, in but even if it's the same kind, if you just put it in new versus like used. Yeah, well, I, I... Some of that degradation, like you'd have to like cite power cycle one to figure out, you know, what is its max voltage to determine is, are my max voltage is different to where if I'm low leveling for the highest or lowest, are you going to further degrade or overpower one, right? Yeah. It, 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 yeah, you, you, you want to use the same kind of batteries. And in, in, in if you're doing a string of them, because you'll end up with charging irregularities. One will end up getting too much. One won't won't get enough. What voltage is this system valid for? What voltages can you charge it at? Well, and you keep it below 230 volts. It ought to be okay. And you can do like one single at 3.7 volts here. Um. Well, this this transformer. That, that's that's part of why I chose this transformer. I got the ratios up there because right now this is going from a 15 to 2 ratio, and and uh, that that's like scaled it based on 240 volts AC at 0.4 amps, and and that would be on the primary side. On the secondary side, you're talking 32 volts AC at 3 amps it would put out. So if you want to charge a string of different kind of batteries, you could use a different transformer. Wait, we're not controlling the voltage through the Arduino. We're we're doing? we're controlling it, but but we, it it's scaled. Um, and, and again, yeah, I I, I I think it it would be um, uh, you, it wouldn't work well if you take too high of a voltage, and and apply it directly to an Arduino. Like if we took 230 volts, and even for short pulses, if you put that directly onto a battery, you allow it to get fireworks. Uh, at what voltage? Like, like this, 240? 240, yeah. That's why we don't switch it directly and dump all that voltage directly on a battery. Right. Here at 100% duty cycle, you've got the 32 volts, so you, you are controlling this through what you program the Arduino. Yeah, the average voltage, yeah. So we're, we're, we're mm. And it, depending on the way you look at it, we're controlling uh, the, the, 
voltage across the batteries, but also we can control the current. And, and it's all based on our inputs over here. How do you control that current there? Well, By changing the voltage, you can only control the voltage, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you they control the <coughs> current by the voltage you, you apply. The, you look at the current across this re resistor, the voltage, and that'll tell you, you can calculate the current on that. You remember our, uh, our voltage law, right? Yeah, dog. So, <coughs> so if we, let's say we're charging it at, at uh, one ampere, and uh, we have a 0.1 ohm resistor, so we'd say 1 times 0 0.1. Well, that gives us, for every 0.1 volt, that's a 1 amp of current going through the batteries. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so that, that's, that's how we determine the, the current. And so what we can do is, we, in, the, in the software, we can look at it and we can say, well, how much current is it getting? And we go there, read it, we calculate it, and we say, oh, this is how much current. And then we can adjust our PWM to give more or less in order to maintain a constant current. So now this is, this is the one that I threw this together pretty quick at the last minute. So this is the electronic side of it, but I don't have the software yet. And so we need uh, maybe get an Arduino programmer guy, somebody who's got an interest in that, to uh, have a look at this and, and to put together some code for us. Otherwise, I'm going to spend three months learning Arduino code. <laughs> okay. You're measuring, so you're saying you're measuring the current at the bottom of the battery pack, but you're measuring the voltage at the top of it, or what's going on there? Well, uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, the, the current is going to, we're, we're measuring it from here, just across that uh, resistor there. I, I did think about it, try to put the resistor at the top. Well, hold on, how come you're saying you're measuring it across it because you're measuring that through that 100K for A0? No. So you got ground, mm -hmm. and then goes to one end of the resistor, mm -hmm. and A0 goes through 100K to this one. And so there, there's mm -hmm. effectively, again, there's zero current is going to go into the Arduino. Uh -huh. it, it's, it's again, it's like in the nanoamperes, it's really small. And uh -huh. so, um, so we're, we're letting just enough to go through the 100K resistor and that 4 nanofarad capacitor to, to give us a balance. And so what we want is we want the um, a voltage reference. Sorry, uh, I did that. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? I was trying to Control zoom in. Z. I'll show you fix. No, you can do it. Control Z on yours. Yeah, Tom can yeah. fix it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So, um, what, what, what were you we saying? <laughs> we were talking about the voltage and the current going through. How do you measure current and how do you measure voltage in a system like a, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the current, yeah, the, and this is just tied to ground right here. The 100K resistor, so that, that's just enough to give us a good steady voltage. Uh, voltage measurement. But, but, but what you want is you want the a DC value of that voltage, but you don't want to get the the uh, pulse width component in there. And so what this is designed for is filtering out the pulses and just show me the average DC value. But you want it to discharge fast enough so you get a, get a speedy feedback, but you don't want it to discharge too fast to where you start getting square waves out, because then, then your values you're reading, it'll be varying all over the place. Yeah. Uh, ground like okay so is that grounded like that ground is the same as the wall outlet nope, ground no, mm -mm. no that's what this isolation is about that's isolated and this is isolated so if you if you look from from this side over the only wires you see connecting over here is these and these go to that optocoupler mm -hmm. and that's what i was saying there's like four thousand volt isolation between uh, the diode and the transistor mm -hmm. so you're measuring so once again, your A0 measures voltage? Right. Uh, well, it measures the voltage across that shunt resistor. So you, using the formula, you can calculate the current. And that's what this is. This is for, for the current. And then the voltage mm -hmm. is, is actually this one. This is going to measure the voltage of the battery. So this goes 10K to 100K. And I chose that on purpose so that it would scale down the voltage on a factor of uh, 10 to 1. Mm -hmm. Or should I say it's it's actually 11 to 1 because we have a total of uh, 110 k ohms there total, and and the part that we're looking at is going to be 1 11th of 
110 K okay. and so so we're in the Arduino we'll take the value we see on a1 we'll divide by 11 and say that this is our voltage mm hmm and that'll be uh, oh and we have to uh, subtract the voltage going to the point across the point 1 ohm resistor <coughs> mm -hmm. something like that that's that makes yes. perfect sense If you study it carefully, yeah. Um, okay, very cool. Uh, oh yeah, and we also need <coughs> to put on there so we can have a charge LED, kind of like you have on the. Okay, so you wall, you know, you can charge, you light you that. Can, you can blink it. You know, you can say while it's charging, you can blink it at one rate. And if you or for example, like when you detect the voltage is already so high, you can make it do something else. Yeah, you can make it blink fast, or you can uh, you could make it blink solid, or you can make it turn off. Mm -hmm. do, do do whatever you like. You need to probably it would be a good idea to follow the convention of other drill manufacturers to see how they blink their lights. Because I noticed I, I have both Porter and Cable and Dewalt chargers mm -hmm. in there, and they blink very similar between mm -hmm. one and the next. There's a light mm -hmm. blinking industry standard. Yeah. <laughs> now, okay. now if you if you really want to go fancy with it, you can in put charge. in a dual color LED. And Whoa. so yeah, and if yeah, we <coughs> you'd have a third lag on there. And so that one, you can make it well, a single yeah. LED, you can make it go green and red, or you can make it blink, or any combination of all that. Mm. Super computer. Yeah, fancy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, mm. um, yes, sir. Let's see. So what happens when you charge a whole string in parallel, like say at 3.7 volts in parallel? What happens if one battery is bad, it will blow up, or what? Whenever you put, if, if you don't have any kind of per battery resistor, um, then, then you'll end up with uneven charging. Because batteries, just the, the nature of them, when they make them, they, they, they don't come out exactly the same. The, mm -hmm. the voltage of each battery is going to be just a little bit different than the other ones. And if you put them all in parallel, all, well, the bulk of all your current is going to go through one battery. The one, whichever one has the lower voltage, mm -hmm. and the others are going to get starved. So you get very uneven charging. That's why it's much better to charge in series. Mm -hmm. Unless that charge is a trickle, in which case it can't handle it, and once it gets charged up, it, the other one starts charging, right? Well, but, but whenever, even if you trickle charge, the same current goes through all the batteries. Not through all of them. It depends on their resistance. So once no, it gets no, charged it, up, it, if they're in series, no, but, but in but parallel, no, if they're in parallel, no, you, you have no guarantee. Trickle or, or max charge. Okay, whatever. but you trickle so that's within the capacity of a single cell. So in other words, once that cell fills up, its resistance goes up, right? So then you start trickling over to the other ones, right? I, I don't think it's gonna work that way. How come? Do, right. Doesn't the battery resistance increase once you charge it well um that that's right um i think it gets into more of the chemical states that can happen because it's not like a solid state device there's chemistry that goes into it um if you if you try to do it like that where you all of a sudden charge one battery 100 percent, it's not going to simply be like a well, now it's full. It's just going to sort of be a pass through for, you know, power to charge the next battery. Well, no, I mean, right? I'm talking about in, in parallel. So all of them get that, you know, you have one line going into all these batteries and combining at the end. So the current goes through the path of least resistance. So the battery that's <coughs> the deadest will get the most current, right? But then once it fills up, it starts accepting less. So well, it yeah. Even out. It, 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 okay. Let, let's say you take the batteries and you charge them all and you get them all 100 percent full. All right. And then let's say you did that in series, or you did it independently. You know, have four different battery charges. You charge and so every battery is totally full. And then you take all those batteries and you put them in parallel, and then you add uh, a power supply on top of it you're still, the bulk of all of your electricity, all the current is going to go through one battery. Because the other battery, each battery is going to have a little bit different 
voltage than the others. That's, that's just not right. all. A lot. It's like pipes, pipes of different thickness. Doesn't mean that just because the way you have a fat pipe, everything's going through. Some some is going to go elsewhere, and then once once you plug plug it up, that the plugging up that pipe is when the battery gets filled. That's the metaphor for it, right? So that well, you well, go to yeah, the and, and that's that's, a, that's what we're saying is we just charge all our batteries. So all our batteries are already at 100 percent. Yeah. But let's say you take you take that and and let's say you. You put them all in parallel, and let's say you just force another one amp through all those batteries. If you go and measure it one battery at a time, you're going to find out that one of the batteries is taking more, you know, the bulk of all that one amp, and the rest of them are be maybe just triple. Yeah. And that's just a problem with batteries when you put them in parallel. And that's whether they charge or discharge, they do the same thing. Okay, so that's the charge condition, that's fine. So yeah, one gets, one gets a lot of it, when it's discharged, yeah. it, it gets most of it, but then it stops getting most of it, doesn't it? Unless it's a yeah. bad cell. <coughs> One thing I would like okay, to so, add about so here's the here's the practical question. Yeah. I got USB chargers. I've, I've got two, two charger types. We got some that have the battery protection for six cells. Yeah. We got that in our kits. We also have smaller ones that are two amps from a USB port or a USB wall wart so that we have an easy way to charge the batteries but those are three you know they're charging at 3.7 volts so the only way it can charge is in, in parallel so I'm saying is that gonna work because that's, that's what we have it, it'll work to some level but but you're gonna end up with some batteries getting more charge than others but not in the limit of time. If you give it enough time, they'll all get charged up just about equally, right? But at that point, you may as well charge them individually. Why? It's because it's safer, and the end charge time will end up being generally the same. You just have to manually go and switch them out. Which wouldn't be practical. You don't want to stay up all night. Like, as I'm saying, like in a practical case, you just put that on overnight. It takes 18 hours to fill. Yes, they will, one will charge it all up first, but then by the end of the night, you'll have everything just about charged. And, and we'll, I'm asking we'll, it as a practical question. Can we do yeah. that? Can we just put this in parallel and just leave it overnight, and it will be fine? Yeah, I think there's a way to do it. We'll need some of the smart charge controllers. they got little things you can put on there that, that do some controlling and charge. And, and uh, those, those things... Well, this, this thing already has that. It has that. Now, now, well, uh, okay, now some of these are battery protection things, like you mentioned. Okay, so I've got the charger. It does that. It has the logic. So I'm yeah. saying it sh that should work to charge up all of them overnight. Okay. Well, should work. Yeah. But I'm, just asking, I'm just trying to verify, like, that's why I'm asking this question. <coughs> like, if you have uneven batteries, or even if they're unevenly charged to begin with, fine, because yes, that just means that one will get filled up first. Mm -hmm. and then it will go to the others. So it will be really crappy only if you want, had a short time and, and you didn't give it enough time to charge. Then yeah, you, like when you get the batteries out of the charger, they will be like dead. Because if you're stacking them in, uh, in series, like after you take them out of the charger. Yeah, because for the Pi, we want to have that configuration. We want to have a battery bank at like the 5 volts for the Pi. So we have that. So so we use we don't want to use like seven. No, we want to use three point seven volts in parallel if we're using multiple packs because the Pi takes about that. You don't want to make an eighteen volt pack because then you're stepping down all the way to the bottom. Well, with three point seven volts, if you put them in parallel, you're still going to get three point seven volts. You won't get yeah. five volts. Yeah, but I'm saying so it'll be pack. Right. So it'll be. We still have a boost converter on that but so okay. we're stepping up still but just a little bit but I'm saying like will that circuit the simple charger dedicated charger that works overnight will that be a sufficient solution for that that's a practical question for our Raspberry Pi tablet right now because we have that I just want the charger yeah. but I don't know if we can comment on it unless we know exactly what that device is right yeah, and then and you got those little little circuit boards they put on each no cell. yeah we can comment exactly on it. it's independent of the charger the charger is a smart charger it puts out as much as it, you know, it has a cap. Mm -hmm. It puts out, like when it senses the batteries are charged, it will stop charging. 
So it's a smart charger. Okay. But the question is, if one battery is dead, like, okay, so you're charging in parallel, uh, practical question is, okay, is it going to be simply fine that, okay, one battery gets charged first, then the second, else, and so forth? I so, think I see what you're saying. So you have a smart charger that maybe handles two cells at a like time. Like one. I mean, it's designed for, I think, for like for one cell. Okay. But, but you want to daisy chain charging. them. Yeah, yeah. Well, not daisy. Well, daisy, yeah. Daisy, parallel. All parallel. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to see the specs of those, the charging circuit, what you we're talking about using. And, and they, they, that battery protection thing. I know part of the battery protection thing is what it's supposed to do is protect it against if you insert the cell backwards. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you, you know you, you, that that protects the battery, keeps the fireworks from going. So smoking you know, the battery. You know. Yeah, it's in a master part list. I mean, I can show you what we've got for that one amp charger for the that would be under the Raspberry Pi section here. I almost dropped one that I had. But also we've got a couple of the string chargers, which are, are a battery protection circuit. We can use that, but I think we only have two of those. Um, so here, Raspberry Pi tablet. Lead driver, no, it might be in the battery section. That's battery well, charger. Yeah. yeah, so we've got one like this. <coughs> oh, yeah, so the one I, I label here, it's these. Yeah. Well, we've got that, but no, we, we've got the <coughs> other one. The we've got two of these, charger. and we've got, so bat charger. I think we got this one. So we got one on one side, that's yes, that's for six batteries, it protects them all, that's all good. And then we've got this one. No. Let's see the third link. That'd be cute to get little bitty power trans transistor on there. Yeah, these one. No. No, same thing. You'll see the, well, where is this in the, no, I think it's the same. Gauge six AMT. Maybe it's in the Raspberry Pi screen pipe. Oh yeah, this one. We got this one too. These little things. So there, you plug them right into a USB. Um, either by wires or by micro USB, mm -hmm. and then it's one amp. Just one amp. That means. Each cell has three amps, so you're going to take three hours per cell, six cells, you got 18 hours, so overnight we're <coughs> charging and you got good batteries. So, so this is a BMS, so it's, whatever you connect it to, it's going to assume that those batteries are um, generally balanced to one another. Yeah. So we, they as long be. as we know that, I think then what you're trying to accomplish should work. Yeah, I, I think we should be good with this, yeah. So just saying. And I was wondering, I was asking you, Tom, if, if you did, is your thing, like the circuit we're showing here, is it somewhat like this, where if you put a bunch of stuff in parallel, like will it work relatively well? I mean, I would say if you do the software so you're charging very slowly, I think the answer should be yes. Because the cool thing here is we can put whatever logic we like on this. Mm -hmm. That Arduino is replacing you know, for how it works, like all that circuitry there, the Arduino, you know, that's mm -hmm. like a little microprocessor in there, whatever yeah, it does, it's replacing that a lot of that. It's probably far more refined or specific of like battery charge management than we're going to come up with on our own. Yeah, that's right, that's right. But if we have the skill, yes, we can do like this, but actually much better because we can have different charging scenarios, like fast charge, slow charge whatever. We have more flexibility with the Arduino if we have the software. Right. Yeah. We need the software for it. Um, so anyway. Yeah. And then feedback. I mean, this is feedback. Anyway, um, let's go at it. So let's build some stuff. I think. So. How far are we on a tutorial? Are we at the end of the tutorials? Uh, pretty close to it. The only other thing we can look at is the water. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about it. That's battery Close that by mistake there. So let's go back to it. Oh, I've got one right here. Mm -hmm. oh, I got it. I got it. It's, it's right on the front page here. 
you've got the beginning it's of the code the, there. Yeah. Yeah, I did throw some example code in there for the uh, battery charges. But, but okay. those are just samples. So here it is. Here's it's back. So I think we're welder. <coughs> Wait, what happened to the pictures? Yeah, I, I had the, the pictures in there for the welder, but I, I wasn't having any success with the actual uh, getting into the work, so I took them out. <laughs> You're a little shy. I don't like, you know, it's, uh, especially publishing things that connect directly to a 230 volt AC wall current. You know, I, Just right. I don't want people don't to do experiment this. too much with right. things that don't work. You know, don't try this at home, kids. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, tower, no. yeah. But but anyway, the welder. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use battery packs, and we're going to connect our welding lead directly to the battery packs with a one sixteenth inch rod, and we're going to put down some metal. That's a great explanation. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's about it. Yeah, and we could have the idea was what we were trying to do is control the voltage so you can. What was our initial idea? Right. Well, the, the initial idea was to drive from uh, the IGBT, use an IGBT to drive directly from the batteries uh, through the IGBT to control it using PWM control to control the welding. But the circuit, anyway, the, the initial one we had, we didn't have any shunt resistors. We didn't measure any voltage or current of the output, so uh, we didn't have feedback for it. And, and uh, the result was is that we got uh, fried IGBTs. Uh, we got at least eight fried IGBTs. From, a, from 24 volt batteries? Yeah. Is that well, this was actually 36 volts of batteries. 36 this was just from car batteries. Volts batteries. Of batteries. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and, and so today, what we're going to do is we're going to create a string of uh, 18650 batteries and then use that as our source to weld from. Okay. So we, we, can, we can experiment with different voltages. Yeah. I found that 24 volts, um, it, it ended up, it didn't, wasn't enough voltage to create a good arc. It, it, it would start doing it, but then the rod would stick and the whole rod would turn red and melt. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that didn't work out too good. We need a little bit more voltage to maintain the arc. Mm -hmm. hmm. So the end voltage would need to be more than 36 volts? No, yeah, more than 24. Okay. There are 36 is what I used, and that worked. No. But but they, and and actually 36 volts, it, it ended up pretty hot. It was a very hot arc. It was spatter and mm -hmm. and it, but but one redeeming thing is I was able with the 1 16th inch rod, I was able to poke hole directly through a, yeah. a quarter inch plate metal. Wow, that's that's <laughs> welding. <laughs> That's more like cutting. <laughs> yeah. Plasma arc. <laughs> yep. Okay. So let's do it. Open source battery pack. Uh, for the battery packs, Luke actually, Luke, a uh, remote guy, he drew up an open source battery pack, which is, we have the 3D print files for it. So that's what that's what it looks like. It's actually a pretty cool thing. Uh, we can print print <coughs> print this. So that's the concept design. Here's you got some warnings. Where's the pictures? Concept. Yeah, he's got the the case. Where's the pictures? It looks like this. Oh, here's a video. Uh, So we can print this, I guess, you guess as a comprehensive uh, walkthrough here. Um, so welcome to a uh, quick video on the... Load that later. But where's the files? He had, oh yeah, so it looks like this. Hmm. Screenshots. So basically a thing that you have a printed case and a top that just fits down. We have to basically slip in some, I mean, how do we do those connections? Because if this is a string of six or so, he actually draws five. Um, we have to kind of figure it out. Like if we want to, I mean, right now for the afternoon, um, is there a quick thing? 
we have a this design here is for five two four five no that's seen? not enough we want to have ten yeah uh these are spring clips on there. Yeah, so so what do we do for the little, like when we put them together, I mean, we can just put a piece of wire and like put a little channel and put a piece of wire or whatever what in there. What are you trying to do? But we're trying to say, uh, how do we, so this is a battery pack, but you have to have connections. So this is in, in series, so you need to alternate them from one side to the other. But you got to connect them with little wires inside. So we can use... Um, we can use wires can and just use uh, CC clamp. We can take a piece of plastic and put our, our wires in there, and yeah. then, then then just put a little wire here, a little wire there, and then on the other side put the wires here and there, and then just clamp it with a C clamp. Yeah, here we have screws like three millimeter screws where it, one side screws into the other. Yeah. Um, we just need some sort of something to compress the yeah. conductors, to make and sure a cool we make good contact. <coughs> cool thing about his design, so once he has it, like uh, I'm not completely sure about the details but basically you if you have bus bars you can put them on so you're stacking them into larger battery packs uh, you've never seen this before have you this guy basically perfected exactly what you're trying to do is it open source 3d printable um, this a lot. Yeah, that's how you. That's how you install it. This is kind of a long video. Let me even fast forward to the final. Uh, I mean, does he have any plans? Or? Oh yeah. Um, so they're open. Okay. Oh, that's cool. I have to look into. So they're creating their own PCB boards. Uh, which means that the front side to hold seven. 18650 batteries. Mm -hmm. They are um, building these boards so that the like mounting holes also conduct current. So they have um, brass standoffs that they screw to like stack these together that yeah. are the bus bars themselves. Mm -hmm. So they have these plastic, you know, battery holders that they mount on. They solder all this together. Um, there's connector for a BMS uh, to be all connected together sort of in parallel with individual or a whole stack of these will have one BMS to manage all of the cells in the array with ribbon cables um, so you can see he's got the standoffs you know set there great um, I bet you can't find the CAD files. Um, he's doubt it, but find them. I'll be glad to see it. Um, they gotta keep me that's in that looks good. They, that they looks pretty good. Something. And so I mean, they even do like infrared measuring to make yeah. sure that I think they can only um, pump out like 10 C power. Yeah. No, it's uh, um, looks good. continuous. Gets up to you know. It's, Higher than 125 degrees or so. I'll have to look more to see if they share all these files because I do know they're trying to. Is that from Tesla? No, I mean they're just sort of they're modeling some of the principles that guys? you know um, mm -hmm. Tesla yeah, yeah. uses, I mean, but they're trying to the files allow people to do this at home on a DIY basis. I'll see if I can find. Yeah, yeah. See if there is. They are there. I mean, I, I would have heard of this. If, I mean, I, I search for this kind of stuff all the time. I never ran into this, so um, it would be a pleasant surprise if I got open plans. Yeah. But as far as the batteries, I mean, so so Luke is the Luke is our guy doing this, but he he used the Open PiSCAD, so we don't have the source. We have the source if you know how to use Open PiSCAD. Um, so let's see what we can do about that.